today I'm speaking with Kyle Butler. Kyle, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me, Tim. Yeah, I'm looking forward to meeting you. We've been trying to get together for a while, so this is great to finally meet you. And I've I've seen a lot of good stuff that you post on uh, social media, so I'm looking forward to picking your brain on some of those topics. But before we get started with that, I just wanted to give everyone a brief bio for Kyle. Uh, Kyle grew up in New Jersey and a little bit of time in Virginia, now lives again in New Jersey. Uh, he has three sisters and one brother, so uh, he's the oldest of five. And I imagine that was a pretty busy household. Is that fair to say? Yeah, fair to say. <laughs> I, would, I would want a four. We've got four kids, so it's I know it's busy here. Uh, he was a pastor for 16 years of a non-denominational church with Pentecostal holiness roots. And he's not married at this point, uh, no children yet. But uh, he's, his life around the church for many years was, uh, excuse me, his life was based around the church for many years. And then something happened. And that's what we're here to talk about today. And today, in terms of just a big picture bio, he does run his own home improvement and renovation business, which um, I, I love uh, hearing about because I used to be a custom cabinet maker. So I've oh, had a little background okay. on that too. Yeah, so good, yeah, cool. Good stuff. Always good to work with your hands. Yeah, so you yeah. feel like you're actually work building something mm -hmm. as opposed to just all digital on the computer. Yeah, um, but that's what I know about you. What else can we know about you as a piece of your big picture bio? Well, another part about me is, uh, you know, I'm just really just a regular, regular average person, um, very laid back, very casual, um, I'm not really easily annoyed or offended. So that's been helpful for me throughout my life. I'm very positive. I have a very positive outlook on life and I've always been a uh, benefit of the doubt kind of thinker. I'm a deep thinker. I think a lot and things have to make sense to me. So that's another uh, interesting part of part of my life. And um you know, I, I just, I, 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 I'm a dreamer, you know, I, I have dreams and there's a, there's an ideal uh, place that I believe humanity can get to. And I strongly believe we can, and we will, and that's a beautiful place of love. So. Well said. I love that. I love that. Well, I'm sure we'll dig into that some more shortly in terms of um, getting into your story. I always like to ask people if you could to start, um, you know, as you share who you are in terms of where you're coming from with religion and and uh, your theology, what was it like from the very beginning? Like, what were the earliest memories you have of of what shaped your religious worldview? The first memory I have is I had to be maybe four or five. Um, my mom came home and I, I didn't know what she was, but she had come home. It was night. And I remember, she, you know, we had a two story home growing up in so she she went up to her room and, and you know I was I was her son so I'm trying to follow her around you know mommy mommy where were you kind of a thing and and I remember her going to the window just yelling out the window I'm free I'm free I'm free or something like that I had no, no clue what she was talking about. I was actually scared I thought she was going to jump out the window or something you know um but that was my first memory of something happened something changed something was different and because I was inquisitive and I was uh, very attentive, I wanted to know what that was all about. And so she and I remember us having this conversation, so to speak, and she said, I got saved. I, I got saved. And of course, I had no clue what that meant. Um, and, and that's kind of where it all started. My mom um, gave her life to Jesus, she believed, and, and that meant that we would too. <laughs> and so yeah. at this point, it was only me and my sister who was, uh, you know, uh, inf she was in her infancy at that point. But, um, you know, for our life, it, it started there. And as she dove into it, her commitment was she was going to bring us along with it. So our whole life changed, you know, uh, everything changed. It, it all became about church. Mm -hmm. And church was all we did. And back in the back in those days, growing up in, in a Pentecostal church, church was our lives. It was all we did. And, and at this at one particular point, um, we had moved from the, the home that we had this experience into an apartment and our church ended up renting the, the church downstairs from where we lived. So it was a three story uh, house and there was a store like a church at the bottom a storefront we would call it and it was apartments above and we lived on the third floor so the church was always there so i remember those years as us always being in church i mean we literally were always in church it'd be you know sunday morning sunday evening wednesday night friday night 
Saturday all day because they require rehearsals and, and clean up days and all this stuff. So it seemed like we were always in church and there was always a revival going on, seemingly, which were five days, seven days straight. And, you know, and, and you kind of brought this in a little bit earlier about the experience in the black church. We didn't go to church for an hour. We, that was that was not church to us. I mean, we 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 would sing songs for an hour before church got started. <laughs> So. that's definitely a difference i i know that I, I even the church that i grew up in like if the pastor went over like the the scheduled time by 15 minutes like people would get annoyed and yeah. when i when i went to bible college we went did uh go to a lot of different churches for just experience sake and when i went to the first black church realizing i mean this was a not quite all day affair but it was a long event and it yeah. was the, the church i was in was uh visiting there was I think three or four hours and they had yeah. um, nurses stationed around the church because people would get so hot from worshiping and singing and they're dressed to the nines and it would just, you know, sweating away. But, you know, they were, they were, they were on fire. Like they really, this wasn't cultural Christianity. They yeah. loved to sing yeah. to Jesus and to hear yeah. the, to hear the message. Yeah. Cause I think for, for a lot of people, and I can't speak for everyone, of course, but I think for a lot of people in our culture, church was this huge escapism this one seemingly safe place. I, I know we grew up with a lot of trauma in the home, a lot of stuff, a lot of just, you know, stuff that shouldn't have happened. So I think for my mom, she lost herself in this place. This was the place she can go to and be safe. This is the place she can go to and not have to deal with any of the outside stuff. And there was a lot. Um, so I think that she, she kind of, you know, mama beared us into that environment as well because we were in church a lot. And so I remember also, because I was always very inquisitive and I, I, I seemingly as a kid could have a adult understanding about things. So very early on, I understood that God doesn't like anything except church. <laughs> you know, so everything else is bad. The only thing God is happy with is church. So, uh, could I would, I would pay attention to the best I could. I was still a kid. So I doze off and get into my own little thoughts at church, but I just remember hearing certain things and it would, you know, it seemed like this God was very angry. Uh, didn't want you to do anything. Didn't want you to have any fun. And the only time God was happy is when you're in church. And maybe that's another reason why we stayed in church so long. <laughs> was there a lot of like what you call fire and brimstone preaching and not just about God isn't happy about you being worldly here but he's also like just unhappy about you and if you don't get right with god hell's waiting for you is it like that or how do they work yeah, we, we didn't we didn't get a lot of the hell teaching but uh we definitely got uh, and i knew very early on that that you know hell and the devil and things like that and uh, i knew also very early on probably around eight or seven or eight that i had only a small window i had you know so by the time the age of accountability, they called it 12. Uh, if, if I didn't get it, if I didn't get saved by 13, if something happened and I was not saved, I was gonna go to hell. So I knew very early on, I gotta check this box. You know, I, I'm gonna be a teenager, a young teenager, preteen rather. And it, but I, 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 you know, I'm gonna live this thing out to the last minute. And I literally did that on my 13th birthday, the first Sunday after my 13th birthday, I was at the altar. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Got to get your fire insurance. Uh, yeah, I needed my fire insurance exactly. But um, well, we didn't get a lot of hell, fire, and brimstone preaching, but we did get a, a a huge dose of God doesn't play. You know, God is righteous and just, and God doesn't play, and God doesn't tolerate this. And it was a lot of sin, 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 and don't do and don't do and don't do and perform and perform and perform. And um. I just really, again, grew up with the idea that, man, God doesn't want us to have any fun. No fun at all. Everything was wrong. Everything was bad. So hmm. I'm just curious when you mentioned you're, you know, you got saved at age 13. For anyone that doesn't know, you know, what that would entail behind the scenes, what would you say, like, if you were, you know, say you, you were still a Christian and you, someone came to you and said, hey, I'm, I'm getting convicted. I think I am a sinner and I think I do have a big problem. And I think, like you said, God doesn't play. And I recognize that when I'm, when I die, you know, I, I'm going to face a judgment and I don't think I'm ready for it. 
how do I get right with God? What would you have said to them? What was the gospel that was presented to you? The way I understood it was that uh, you need to confess you're a sinner and that Jesus died for your sins. And you need to invite Jesus to come live in your heart. Now, as I said, I did this at 13 and watching my mother all these years since that moment back in, when I was four or five, watching my mother and, and, and I, I'd never seen my mother even prior to this. I, I wouldn't even remember, but I'd never seen my mother curse or get really like nasty or, or do anything that, you know, would be sinful. I, I'd never seen her do anything like that anyway. So definitely during these years, I most certainly never saw her doing those kind of things. Um, so she became uh, the prototypical type Christian for me early on. And, you know, she was always very loving and very kind and very gentle and very meek and all those things. And I remember at 13, when I went to the altar, now I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm the big brother here, right? So part of my personality is I'm an instigator. So I used to love to pick with my sisters. I'd love to rile them up, you know, get them all excited because I'm the laid back guy. So I get you excited and riled up and upset and I'm sitting back laughing. That was a big part of who I was as a growing up with my sisters. So I remember going down there 13 to the altar, doing the sinner's prayer. And um, I remember instantly thinking, I don't feel any different. I was expecting some feeling, you know, some something to happen. I didn't feel any different. I went home and, and told my mom, because at this point we were living, we had just moved to Virginia. My mom hadn't found a church yet. Um, so she would visit here and there, but there was this, uh, this, this, we called it the church bus. And one of the bigger churches in the town would send out buses to the little subdivisions to pick up people who ever wanted to come to the church. So they go around and knock on doors and, and introduce themselves and say, Hey, every Sunday we send a bus. And, you know, if you want to send your children to church kind of thing, my mom felt okay with it. And she would send us, we call it the bus church. We go in the bus church. Um, I think it was a Baptist church. I don't even remember, but um, so anyway, I go down to the altar. I do this thing. I'm expecting to feel something. I didn't feel anything. I come home. I tell my mom, 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 I got saved today. And she's excited. She's just over the moon excited. And she says to me, I'll never forget that. She says, okay, now, you know, God is expecting you to, to live right. And like, again, 13, you, you put this on a 13 year old, <laughs> You know, now you feel like you've got the, the eyes, and the weight of God on your shoulders, like, you know, and I remember those cartoons, the angel over here and the devil over here, and you're thinking, you know, kind of thing. But, um, you know, by Monday or Tuesday, I was back to being Kyle, instigating with my sisters, getting upset, doing all the things I'd done prior to this conversion, so to speak. So I went back to church on Sunday. And I went back to the altar to the altar call again because I was thinking I didn't I, something didn't work because nothing changed. Yeah. <laughs> you know? did, can I ask for for the first time you did that and even the second did did you feel at least a sense of relief that hell wasn't a threat anymore or did you worry about maybe because you weren't sure it was real that maybe hell was still a pending issue? Yeah, I, I didn't. I didn't. I, I, I. That wasn't. A, that was on my mind, which led me back to the altar. Because again, I don't. The whole entire reason why I went was to get this insurance, as we call it, fire insurance. I didn't want to go to hell. I didn't want something. I didn't want to get hit by a car or some accident happen. And and at you know fourteen, I'm poof. I'm out of here, and I wake up in hell. I didn't want that. So I was scared. I was. I was terrified. I was. I was. You know. My calendar was being, you know, blocked off, so to speak, at coming up to 13. So when nothing changed, nothing happened, I went back down to the altar the second week and the third week and the fourth week. And on the fifth week, I guess one of the deacons recognized that, okay, I think this little boy's been down here every week. He said to me, come here, son. He said, you don't have to keep coming down here every week. You, you, you know, you came one time, you're good, you're saved. And I said, are you sure? Because I don't feel any different. <laughs> That's good, though, that you were so brave to be honest with him. Yeah, because I mean, I'm expecting uh, something should have happened. I should have, it should have transformed me or changed me or something should have happened. I mean, I should be different. <laughs> but I wasn't, not by far. <laughs> 
So uh, that that it, it, his words did comfort me a little bit because I figured he was older and he knew what he was talking about and he must know. So that that's kind of how that journey began. So I, I guess back to the question, so to speak, I would I would just tell I would have told someone you got to give your life to Jesus. Uh, I probably would have gone a little bit more detail. You know, you're not going to necessarily everything in your life's not going to change because, you know, we have to we got to We have to make excuses now. Right. So because the the pre the, the pre speech, the 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 pitch is give your life to Jesus. He'll change your life. He'll turn your life around. He'll make you better. He'll you know, you'll stop and you'll you know kind of thing. And then, of course, when it doesn't happen, now we got to have our, our backups and our excuses. Well, you know, you give life to Jesus now, 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 now it's a journey now. So just, you know, understand you, you're going to have to learn how now to walk in the spirit and live in the spirit and all this work, <laughs> you know, which is which is interesting, Tim, because the pitch is. You need Jesus. OK, fine. So you get Jesus. And immediately after you get Jesus, then all the fine print comes in. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's a lot of fine print. And if you, if you, if you ask a Christian, pastor, Christian, anyone that, you know, is in this evangelical kind of evangelism kind of mindset that out here trying to reach the world. If you ask them one simple question of like, okay, listen, if I give my life to Jesus, that's it, right? And they'll probably say, no, 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 that, that, that's just where it starts. And then you say, but wait a minute, you told me all I need is Jesus. Well, <laughs> you know, so that's what I learned early on was that I had Jesus. I, 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 I kind of got some security, but now the work begins. Yeah. And it, do you remember that verse, the my yoke is easy and my burden is light? Yeah, 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 yeah. In yeah. the context of what you're saying, that used to really confuse me because I was like, I know I'm confused and struggling. And I know a lot of other people, you know, thinking of my Bible, Bible college days, got, you know, guys who are struggling like crazy and feeling very little joy in the Lord and right. very little victory. And it's like, if the yoke is easy and the joy of the Lord is our strength and right. God doesn't send his word out and not perform what it's meant to do, it doesn't come back void, then like, where is the joy where's the power where's the you know the dunamis the, the dynamite power as he's to preach right. yeah. you know where's dunamis, the holy spirit yeah. that's transforming our lives and our hearts and why is life so burdensomely heavy yeah and i know that in the christian theology context you'd be like like look the, you, you trust god in the in the dark valleys and in the light you know that's not what this is about it isn't about you get saved so your life gets easy but at the same time you want to sense that in those dark valleys you don't feel like it's just you that you feel like there is truly a a difference that God's there. He's guiding you and giving you a uh, piece of some kind. And I think you're, you're right that there's those details that can come in. And one of the biggest details that came in for me, and I'd be curious if you had this too, is the whole concept of what's called lordship salvation. Are you familiar with that mm -hmm. phrase? Mm -hmm. Where they're basically saying, um, Jesus is your savior. He did rescue you from your sins, mm -hmm. but he's also Lord. He's the master. He's the king. Yeah. And the point of lordship salvation isn't to say, you need to make him the Lord and the King. It's to say he already is the King, but if you're right. acting like he's not, then basically it's like he's on the throne and you're trying to get on his seat, on his throne. So yeah. put yourself in the right spot. He's in charge. He's the judge. You're not, you know, rank yourself correctly and then stop saying life's about me. Life's about my wants. It's about what he wants. You know, my, it's not my will be done. It's your will be done. Like Jesus said. And so it becomes this really strong you can preach this really well, um, you know, the strong message of like, look, if Jesus isn't visibly Lord in your life, if he's not the master, then it isn't a question of you should make him master because he's already master. That's not a question. It's that maybe you're not truly saved because if you're truly saved, the spirit's not going to let you keep being selfish. The spirit's yeah. not going to let you keep trying to get on Jesus's throne. He's right. going to convict you that Jesus is the Lord. He is the King. So if you're struggling to, to, to let him be the king and the master of your life, then you need to question yourself because a true Christian wouldn't, wouldn't want to be the king. You'd want Jesus to be the king. Yeah. And that, that brings up that detail of like, again, like maybe I'm not saved because it is a struggle. And, you know, like you said, you, you did it a few times in a row, but, and a lot of people do it even over like a period of years, like where it's like, 
I got saved at five. I got saved at 10. I got saved yeah. at 13. I got saved at yeah. 17. And because you're just not sure. And there's so much at stake. And you're like, if you struggle with the world, the flesh and the devil at all, you're like, I'm not sure if I'm actually on the right side of this. Yeah. It puts you in a bad spot. Like you, you can truly yeah. get to a point where you're like, I think I've loved Jesus for 10 years and I'm not still not sure I'm saved. Yeah. 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 That's a, that's a, <clears throat> a real, real, real issue. That's why altar calls sometimes have the the phrase rededication. And, yeah. and that's a, that's huge in churches. Um, we do the normal altar call or however you do it. You tell people to raise their hand or stand or acknowledge or come to the altar and to get their salvation. And oftentimes in churches, because you're really preaching to people who supposedly are already Christian, right? Uh, you may have some visitors here and there, and maybe you'll get one or two of those visitors to raise their hand. So the bigger emphasis now becomes on rededication. So, because we, we, you know, we, I know as a pastor, and I know now that this is ego, but after you've preached and you feel like you've poured out what you felt a God gave you, you want to see that all to full. You, you want to see convicted people, contrite people at that altar crying and, you know, feeling like, you know, they're going to do better. So um, we would, we would make our pitch. And I, I was never really good at the altar call thing, be honest with you. I was never really good at it because it, so much of this never really made sense, but you go through these these things, these ritualistic traditions, but I was really bad at altar calls. I, I, I was really bad at them. Um, but there was still the egoic part of it that wanted to see whenever I did them, you wanted to see the altars fall and to have your moment of, of, of that luminous power you spoke of that where your, that power is going to be on display. You're touching people and they're falling out and you're praying for people and they're crying their eyes out or whatever, or you feel like you're giving them something. Probably even more um, so in the Pentecostal tradition, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like you really yeah, want to see the huge. power, like they fall yeah. down. <laughs> yeah. You need to fall down. Um, now I, I want to maybe later on in the, in this interview, want to go back to the Lordship salvation piece, because that probably more than anything, and I'm going to use this word and I mean it destroyed my adult life. Mm. took away all my dreams, all my goals, all my ambitions, everything that I wanted to do that I saw myself as an eight-year-old boy, that lordship salvation, that lordship mentality, that Jesus is Lord, your life, your life doesn't matter, what you want doesn't matter, who you are doesn't matter, you submit, it's only about God's will, God's way, if you want to make it, if you want to live, you want to prosper, if you want God's blessing, you want God to fulfill his words over your life, you've got to give it all to him, trust him, let him lead you, let him guide you. That was a huge, huge, huge part of what I, what I understood growing up that I needed to do. Um, and, and so later on, we'll probably talk a lot more about how that literally destroyed most of my adult life. Hmm. Yeah. Crazy. What, I'm curious, as you're going through the altar calls there from at age 13, at what point did you like, did that stop or, or did it stop? Did it keep going for, for a long time? Or did you at some point feel like, you know, I've, I've definitely planted my flag. I'm a Christian now. Yeah, I, I knew I was a Christian, although I, you know, again, I'm a teenager. So I had no ambition on or any plan on living the, trying to live up to the Christian ideal. I'm a teenager. I want to, I want to hang out with my friends and have fun and, you know, do what teenagers do. I was ashamed to be a Christian. I, I never, I wasn't one of these Bible toting flag waving t-shirt wearing Christians. I was ashamed to be known, to be known as a Christian. I wouldn't tell any of my friends about Jesus or witness to anybody. And I don't care how sad their stories were. I was literally ashamed of the whole thing. Uh, Cause again, it never felt right. And I can acknowledge this very early on. It never felt right. Um, and then watching a lot of the fanaticism go on around me in church, it was embarrassing too. You know, people like speaking in tongues kind of stuff or. Yeah, we, yeah, we, we were, we did a lot of that stuff. We called it the move of the spirit, the dancing, the speaking in tongues, really more just over the top emotionalism and fanaticism. Um, but it was, it was how we felt the presence of God would show up and, 
in our services, the presence of God had to show up every week. There had to be some display of power, we, 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 we thought, in order to believe we had church. And, you know, I look back on it all now and I realize it was just nothing more than a play on the emotions. It was all emotional. Um, and, and, and I tell people this, listen, I'm not here to take away what you believe your experience was. I, I, I can't do that. Um, because there are people in my church that will sit next to me and say, no, no, Kyle, you're wrong. That was God. I felt his power. I felt God move. I felt, I heard God speak. Um, I'm going to say, I thought so too, but I look back on it now and cool reflection. And as I contemplate it more and more and more, I can see me in it as my emotions. I connected to something. I gave my emotions over to something, to an ideal, to a feeling, and I let it fly. Now, I would, I would like to say that that's really how it works for everyone, um, unless there really was something happening and God just overlooked me. <laughs> that would be the only other you know, explanation, uh, which I don't think would have happened if it were real. Because I, I often tell people, too, well, how is it then, then, if you're in a church and, quote, the presence of God is here and moving, how can there be people just in church like this? How yeah. is it when the worship team is at its highest peak of the worship songs, people are just like this? If it is a presence, if it is a move, if, if God's presence is here, why isn't it affecting everybody? How can people just, you know, of course, they're going to say, well, you know, God will violate someone's free will. Exactly. Right. So I have to freely give myself to this environment. And that's all I'm doing. I'm giving myself over to this environment that's full of this elect electric this, 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 this vibrational energy of, of hype in a, in a lot of places, or if it's, if it's a mellow environment, the music's playing lowly, someone's talking softly and, you know, God, this and God, this, and you know, you can do better. So now I'm giving myself over to this emotional sorrow, oh, Jesus, I love them so dear, whatever. Um, but that's, that's my honest take on it from a, a, a reflective view of my experience. And that's another thing too, Tim. I think Christianity would be better off served to humanity if it's just willing to be honest. Why, why, why are you afraid in talking to the institution of Christianity why are you afraid to take a look at your narratives mm. and admit they don't work? They're wrong. If the goal here is really to help people, to make people's lives better, to get people closer to a God, if this is really the goal, then why aren't we willing to ditch what isn't working, which is nonsensical, and find out what does work so that people can really have an impact of, that this can really impact people's lives, mm. you know, but Christianity doesn't want to do that. Yeah. I think that's a fantastic point. Um, I was just going to say too, about the whole hype thing. I think a lot of people mistake the, literally the music, especially the loud music is the spirit. Like I remember right. being at a, a concert, I think it was DC talk and audio adrenaline mm -hmm. back in the day, <laughs> dating myself. Yeah. But you know, like, you know, in a big stadium and heavy, heavy music, and you literally feel like your, your, your spine is tingling and you're like, I've never felt that before. And you're like, that's the spirits moving. You know, that's why we would do this stuff. So the spirit is free, but like leading to, to the other points, what you're saying, like the idea that there's no power here where it's not changing people's lives that I would just want to do it is one of the profoundest things that I observed in two big areas. Number one, I had a, a grandmom who she had listened, she'd listen to Christian radio for two hours a day. She'd be in church, um, you know, everything, the whole nine yards, just, just the best kind of Christian lady you could be. And I, I saw her like, you know, her, her life up close. And she was one of the most selfish and, and uh, self-centered people that I'd ever met. And I thought if you're exposed to the gospel for 40, 50 years, shouldn't it change you by now? Like by the time you're in your seventies and eighties, shouldn't it change you a little bit? And it didn't like, she was just, she was as selfish as if she'd never heard of Christ. And the other thing was, I remember 
when I was in my church, I did some internships for the past to be a pastor. And one of the big things that they would push, I'm sure you had this too, is if you are trying to get into the ministry, what you need to do is to get under the mentorship of an older uh, pastor. Yeah. Yeah. And they would literally at, at college and in church, they'd say, find a man where you can look at him and say, I look at his, his ministry. I look at his marriage. I look at his kids. And I think I want to be like him. Mm -hmm. And I remember looking around my church, it was a pretty big church and a lot of men there, a lot of families thinking, I don't think there's a single man in this church, including the pastors that I want to be like, I'm like, I don't want to be like these people. Yeah. And that was, that shook me up. I was like, how can there be a church full of godly men? And I look at them and yeah. think, I don't want to be like you all. I really don't. There's some, there's some cool things about certain people, but by and large, you all don't look very happy. You look yeah. very miserable and mm -hmm. you don't sound very wise. And a lot of things you say, you look very boring. You look like yeah. you're just, you know, like a, like you're halfway in the grave or something. And it's like, I don't want to be like you. I want to be on fire. And, and, and of course, that's where the youth pastor becomes your typical um, magnet because the youth pastor comes in and is like so excited and on fire. Like, oh, I want to be like him. I finally found someone. But that was about as close as I ever got to thinking, I want to be like these men. I just really didn't want to be. And I, I remember, you know, again, echoing what you're saying, like that, that shook me up. Like, yeah. why, aren't, why aren't there dozens of men that I'd love to be under their tutelage? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, from 13 on, um, I, I try my best to, to be, you know, to, to what we call was, um, what, what we call it like, um, pl um, playing the fence. So, you know, you, I, 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 of course I'd be in church every Sunday and, and, and at this point we had started doing youth services. So the lot would often fall on me to give the message, to give a little word. So I, I started preaching at 13 it was the first wow. time I stood up in front of people and to teenagers only message. or to adults. Yeah. Well, the, you know, the, it was a youth based service, but the all the adults were there as well. So, you know, there's that huge pressure. And then from, you know, 13 to about 19, um, seemingly to me every other week, um, through youth camp, through, um, <clears throat> church services and different things, somebody was coming up to me with the word of the Lord, uh, talking about how God's going to use my life and God's plans for my life and all this other kind of stuff. Now, growing up in this church environment, like you said, I, I, was, I was very observant, like you were, I was, I'm watching the men in my church, I'm watching pastors, I'm watching visiting pastors, and, and just nothing appealed to me. It was very unappealing. And I remember as a young kid being in this, thinking about life and future possibilities. I remember saying very early on, I don't want to be a pastor. Like there was nothing about it that, that enticed me, that excited me, nothing. Well, during this 13 to 19 time frame, seemingly everyone and their mother was coming up to me prophesying about God's plan for my life. And most of these words seemed to center around or revolve around some type of ministry. And I was 16. This is probably the one that was most impactful. I was 16 and uh, we had a visiting pastor come and we were in Virginia at this point. Um, and, um, and, and interestingly, uh, we were actually going to a white church in Virginia, which was totally different than the church we had grown up in because the emotionalism wasn't there. The fanaticism wasn't there. It was more settled and calm and and, and sound it was more sound if i can use that terminology uh but it was it was and it, it was it was also surprisingly uh the place where i felt probably the most love um in that church the people were beautiful people they they embraced us and accepted us and it was really nice but um so at 16 i'm in that church and a, a guest speaker would come one day I'd always have guest speakers and they they flowed a lot and you know and the prophetic, they call it. And in church circles, you, you hear that that phrase a lot. Oh, they, you know, this church flows a lot in the prophetic, or this church flows a lot in this. And I guess it's kind of like their specialty. So Does I'm it mean 16, like the spirits flowing? Is that what that's yeah, like you know, they do a lot of this particular thing, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm 16, I'm minding my own business. Uh I was I was called up and and the guy came and and stood in front of me and 
and begin to talk about, you know, again, these plans God had for me and how God was going to do this and God was going to do this. And, and he said uh, two things that really startled me, shook me. Uh, one was God has prepared a wife for you. Don't go searching on your own because, uh, you know, the devil's also going to try to trick you. So I'm 16. Uh, again, 16. This is, well, I'll get into that. And, and also, um, you know, follow God's plan and will for your life or else. It was something along those lines. So I remember I get in the car. I was so distressed, so heartbroken by this word. Because at this point, I'm putting it together. I'm putting these pieces together. Like, okay, I don't want to be a pastor, but God darn it, looks like I've got no choice. Because I also grew up with a heavy, heavy influence of you better do what God wants you to do or else. I, I grew up with that very, very strong influence. So I get in the car and I'm, I'm dejected and I'm heartbroken, so to speak, because I know I can't beat God. I know I can't outdo God. I know that I'm not stronger than this God. I grew up with that understanding as well. And I said to my mom, the first thing was, mom, does this mean I have to be a pastor? And I was so broken. I was so discouraged. And, and, and to her credit, but also I think a huge discredit, to her credit, I think she understood it from her, her understanding, like, yeah, you got to be a pastor. But she said, well, son, well, you know, maybe God just wants you to be in ministry. To her credit, she tried to comfort me somewhat. But now as I look back on it, to her huge discredit, she should have said, son, you can be whatever you want to be. This is yes. your life. You, you, could, you could do whatever you want to do. Whatever you feel inside of you is what drives you, what, you, what your passion is, what you desire. You can do that. But she didn't. Because her whole world was this church, this God, this Jesus, this, this was her whole world. So I think in her eyes, there was a great sense of pride and a hope for her firstborn to come up and follow after her and be, you know, this thing. So I think she saw from that perspective, which is incredibly selfish and in trying to live her life through me. Um, you know, that's well, that is trauma. the pinnacle though. I mean, that's like, yeah. if you're a pastor or missionary, you, you're yeah. in the, you're in the top echelon. I mean, there's yeah. nothing better than you could do with your life than preaching the gospel. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that, that took me through 16 to eight, uh, 13 to 19 or so. Can I ask like a question before you go into the next sure. stage, the sure. prophesying thing, mm -hmm. was that like, Hey, we, we hear God putting it on our hearts to tell you, we think you should consider the pastorate or is it more like we've had a vision and you are going to be a pastor as if it's like, it's like your fate, like you can't fight yeah. this. And if you try to yeah. fight it, you're just, you're going to end up like, here's you and here's you in five years, you're going to be a pastor. You either go straight there and enjoy the peace of the Lord for a bang, or you take a wiggly line and he's just going to keep pushing you back until you, until you obey, but it's going to happen. Was it like you have to, or, or, or it's, you know, it's bound to happen. Or is it more like, we just feel like you should consider it. Like, how does the prophesying work in that context? Yeah, it's, it's very deliberate. It's, it's very, very deliberate in the aspect of this is what God is saying for you. Just like, God has planned, God has chosen a wife for you. Uh, and I remember thinking like, okay, what does that mean? One of the huge problems I have with this prophecy jazz is it is incredibly vague, incredibly vague. So a God will tell you to tell me that he's prepared a wife for me. I'm 16. And that same God never comes back to give me any clarity about this whatsoever. But he's given me this warning to make sure I don't pick the devil's choice. Well, how the hell am I supposed to know? I don't know. Did God send this person or the devil send this person? I don't know. <laughs> right. So what happens if someone says like the opposite? Like they say, I've, I've, I've got a vision and you're supposed to be a elementary school teacher how does that happen how does how does that work out almost the same thing like you know it really depends i guess it depends on the person right because uh, see my sisters grew up in the church and they didn't take things as strongly as i did 
So if if they were standing up there and God, and, you know, somebody was prophesying over them and, and saying they was going to do something they didn't want to do. And my sisters, I know this for a fact, my sisters and my brother, they would have been like, I'm not doing that. They would have stood there humbly at the moment. But inside, they would have been saying, oh, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing any of that. None of that, you know. And they would have just held that inside of them. Like, yeah, I hear that. But I guess God going to have to be upset at me because I ain't doing any of that. Well, see, I, I was on the opposite side of that. I was like, I guess I have no choice. I got to do what God wants me to do. I mean, did you ever and, hear anybody prophesy something that would have contradicted that? Where someone says, you know, on a Monday, they say, Kyle, we've, we heard God saying, you're definitely going to be a pastor. And on Tuesday, someone says, you're definitely going to be an elementary school teacher or a carpenter. Like, did anyone ever contradict each other in church? No, no. And another thing, too, like, and, and you don't realize this until you realize it. You're in a church and they're all, everyone's hearing the same thing. So, you know, when the next person gets there, oh, I've got a word for Kyle. You know, they're, they're going to, they're going to know this sense of what it's all about because they've heard other people say the same thing. So to them, they're bringing confirmations, you know, um, and you grew up in That's that environment and you just, you know, you don't know any different. And, um, and, and, you know, from a God perspective, right? So this God is supposed to be a loving father. And I'm not a father yet. I know you are, you have four children. And I can imagine just in this short time with you that you want your children to have the best and to have the best experience to find themselves. And I, I get a good sense that you as their father will stand behind them and support them for wherever their dreams and passions are as they discover them for themselves. Well, why doesn't a God do that? I mean, mm -hmm. shouldn't this God be the prototypical example of that? Like, okay, Kyle, find out what you want to do, what's inside of you, what drives you, what excites you, find that, and I'm going to give you my full backing. That's not the experience I had, and most people probably have. The experience most people probably have is, I got to find out what God wants me to do. I got to find out what God's will is for my life. I've had people tell me in my church, different people I've met over the years, that you marry who God tells you to marry. Attraction doesn't matter. Love doesn't really matter. You marry who God tells you to marry. And I know countless of marriages that have been married under that premise that have horrible marriages that have ended in divorce and all those kind of things. Mm. Because the, this, this persuasion is so strong. And if you grew up in, in my environment where we struggled a lot, we were, we, you know, we were impoverished and we struggled and it was hard for us financially, my parents. Um, you don't want to add hardship because the, the another narrative is if you don't do what God wants you to do, he'll make you. And by making you, he'll bring hardships in your life to humble you. Right. Yeah. So I grew up with it. We grew up with enough hardships. I'm like, I don't want any more. So I better just do what God wants me to do because I don't want to make it harder on myself. You mm -hmm. know. And there are verses that uh, I think it's James. Um, don't be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever you sow, you will yeah. reap. I remember. Uh, just to interject a quick story. I remember um, in my church there was a couple that had three kids, and the youngest one um, was a young girl who had muscular dystrophy, I believe, where like it was probably eventually going to put her in a wheelchair but as a preteen she was more like she just kind of walked with a hobble uh, but it was very visible the sweetest girl you'd ever could imagine um but the parents were getting to a point of divorce and they went to the pastor and said you know we're thinking about divorcing and the pastor warned them like if you do this god says he hates divorce he will get you for this yeah. And a few months later, their little girl was over at a sleepover at another girlfriend's house, you know, like two 10 year olds and so forth. And the parents of that, you know, of that other girl that they were sleeping over, they had stepped out, I guess, to, you know, get some food or something. And there was a teenage boy in the house, um, kind of just, you know, keeping things safe. He starts a pot of water for something and it, you know, drapes start on, catch on fire. The whole house burns down. They all, all the kids die very tragic situation and the, the narrative is you could probably guess where i'm going with this is yeah see god told you don't pursue divorce you did it 
And look at what it costs you. Your 10 year old daughter died. The sweetest thing in the world got taken from you because you wouldn't do it God's way. God's going to get you if you don't obey. And yeah, it's, it can, and when you put those pieces together that way, it can yeah. scare the bejesus out of you because you're like, wow, this yeah. is serious. And it's, yeah. it's, it reminds me a lot of animism too, where in tribal locations, like they have little things that you do, you know, you, you don't, if you have a big garden, you don't cut the, your, your vegetables down quickly. You cut them down very slowly with a little teeny paring knife. Cause if you upset the spirit of the field, he'll get you. And they tell stories, you know, I, you know, I, I did something and sure enough, you know, the tree branch fell on my head and tried to kill me. Yeah. And it's very, it ends up being very animistic, very ritualistic. And, yeah. um, you know, if you do these right things, God will protect you right. and bless you. Uh, but there are verses, was it um, Psalm 1 or Psalm 2 said, you know, mm -hmm. if, if you, if you obey me, blessings, yeah. if you don't yeah. obey me, cursings. Yeah, and it's, too. Yeah. yeah, people try to write those off. Well, what, what can God possibly do that wouldn't be a blessing if you're his child? Yeah, but some of these threats are like, if you disobey me, I'll let you go off to be, um, you know, captured by the foreign enemies and it'll get yeah. so bad you'll eat your own kids. Like, like yeah. don't cross me or you will literally become cannibals. Yeah. Um, and it's it's very real and it's very much in the in the text. Yeah, very much in the text. It's littered throughout the whole text itself. I mean, you, you know, sometimes people try to say, well, you know, we really shouldn't put a lot of stock in the Old Testament. That was just, you know, but then because Jesus came and when Jesus came, that changed everything. Well, you, you got the story of Ananias and Sapphira, right? So, yeah. I mean, that's New Testament. You got you got Paul telling people, you know, very harsh warnings. Um, about yeah. Hebrews, our God preach. is a consuming fire. Yeah. It's a fearful exactly. thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Yeah. Yeah. And then you have this, this, this ending book or writing called Revelation that pretty much sums it all up with this Jesus coming back, really destroying two thirds of the world and throwing two thirds of all of the population that ever lived in a lake of fire. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it's, it's troubling hmm. as you look at it now with, the, with a different set of eyes. Yeah. So, you know, we, we, we grew up with an idea because you hear this story in Sunday school. So the way that is often presented is, that Noah went around knocking on doors, telling everyone to repent and, and come to the ark for, to be saved. So, you know, the, you, 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 when you hear the story of Noah's ark and the flood, you, 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 you understand it, that this is God's righteousness and this is God's judgment. And these people had a chance. They had a chance. They, they could have got on the boat because no one warned them all. He went around and knocked on all the doors and he preached the gospel to them all these years. But now you think about it without that indoctrinated mindset. You think, well, how did he do that? I mean, how did he go around the whole world to everybody repeatedly and warn them while he was still building this big boat and being a father and being a husband? And I mean, it wouldn't make sense if this story was in the 21st century, 22nd century, right? It, it makes sense if it was in today's world because there's internet and there's radio and there's television, there's ways to get all of this information to reach everyone, right? There, so it makes sense. Okay, you look, for 15 years, the warning signals have been going out. 15 years daily, all day, nonstop. No one's without excuse. Okay, okay, well, all right, you're right, they had a chance. But we're talking about Noah's days. So, so what is that like? He goes, knocks on the door. Hey, I want to warn you, the rain is coming. What? What's rain? Well, you know, God's going to flood the earth. You're going to die if you, you know, I, I can see somebody if they had a weapon back then, cocking their weapon, <laughs> get off my property, you lunatic. You know, like, how would that work back then? How How is he getting around to warn everyone? So, you know, you hear the story and this, it, this is God's judgment. So a lot of that stuff that you, you, you just mentioned in that horrific story, that's how it's, it's viewed is, well, they were warned. This is on them. They know God is righteous. God is just. God hates this and God hates that. And we made so many excuses for that barbaric God to keep existing instead of confronting it and calling it for what it was. And we should have, and I'm, I'm happy that there are people that have the courage to do it because the stories are in black and white. 
And people can call them allegorical and metaphorical and parabolic, and they, you call it whatever you want to call it, but the stories are in black and white. And they're often taught in black and white. They're often taught literally, not allegorically, not you know, parabolically or metaphorically. They're often taught literally. People use those stories. You mentioned a little bit of Psalms 1, but also Psalms uh, Deuteronomy 28, that if you hearken to the voice of the Lord and do all of his commandments, he will cause these blessings to come on you. But if you don't hearken to the voice of God and all of his commandments and all of his statutes, he will cause all these curses to come upon you. I mean, it's, that's, that's literal. There's no allegory there. <laughs> Yeah. You know, it's a do or don't. Like, it's like a parent standing in front of a child. Hey, if you clean your room, I take you for ice cream. If you don't clean your room, you get no ice cream. There's no allegory there. <laughs> exactly. And, he, and the, the stories that come out, they, they do experience exactly what is predicted. Because the, yeah. obviously the, the theologians and the priests or whatever that are writing these stories, the scribes, they're, they're carrying these themes throughout it. So they're like, look, we warned you. Now it's actually happening. This is this is what you're experiencing, and you get those um, horrible things, and it's it really is a, a a threatening thing, and it's it's amazing to me how people don't have any trouble, especially in progressive Christianity, just focusing on the good stuff. And I remember going to a fairly progressive um, Presbyterian church, and it was just like, God, you're a good good father, you love us so much, and it's just you know very very you know touchy feely a little bit, but just, you know, God, you're such a good father. You'll never do anything wrong for us. You're so faithful. And it's like, yeah, he's faithful, but he'll, he's also faithful to get you. Yeah. Um, and there's a verse, I think it's in first Timothy that um, talks about if you confess him, he'll confess you. But if you don't confess him, he'll deny you. Yeah. And it's like, <clears throat> this carries through, he's, he's going to get you. And the idea of teaching kids that at the same time as trying to teach, teach them that your God is a good father. I'm like, I teach with my, I do did this with my kids. And I say, imagine that I had a, we had a big fenced in garden uh, yard where you can play, but the neighbor next door, uh, he raises venomous snakes that'll kill you in a heartbeat and they're locked up. But I just found out that there's a hole in our fence. And I just found out from the neighbor that his snakes are literally like wandering in his yard and they could come through to our yard. What kind of father is going to say to his kids? Now go play in the garden. Right. Well, that's exactly what Adam and Eve would have faced if it had been real. Yeah. Or the idea of hell, like I think if, and I say to them, if if I hold your finger onto a hot frying pan, mm -hmm. I say, if I do it for forever, would I be a bad daddy? Yes. Well, if, what if I did it right. for two minutes? Yes. But what if I did hold your finger into the frying pan for one millisecond, just like that on purpose? Would I be a bad daddy for burning your finger? Absolutely. Yeah. And it's like, but yeah, he's a good, good father. Like you can't right. put these together. They don't, right. the narratives do not merge. And right. it really makes me, that was one of the things that helped me to say, we're all experiencing a mass cognitive dissonance. Like that's yes. just, yes. you can't put this together. Yes. Yes. And that's ultimately one of the things that helped me as well. See, I started to humanize those stories. Uh, you, you start with Noah's Ark and, and you say the whole world evil. 12 year olds, five year olds, 75 year old people who, because remember, like, these are nomadic people for the most part. They, 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 they find a patch of land, they, they raise their families on it. The families are multiplying and generating out of this land. They, they stay together in their little groups. I mean, I'm not saying people, quote, didn't do anything wrong. And, and that's whole sin thing. That's, that's a whole nother man made concoction in my mind. But um, whatever you want to call it wrong. I, I'm not saying no one did anything wrong, but what could they have done that was so bad? Were people having parties and were there clubs? Were there, were there, I mean, what could have possibly been so bad? I mean, what did they do with their days? They got up, they tended their, their fields and, and because they had to produce food for themselves, there were no supermarkets to go to. There was no, no manufacturing companies, man, mass manufacturing food. And you just go to the market whenever you needed food. No, they had to do all this themselves. They had to build their homes and, 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 and take care of their land and raise their family. And, you know, there was no TV, there was no internet. There was no ways for the evilness of the world to get in so what could have been so bad that these people were doing 
what? Yeah. I mean, I, again, I would understand it. If you maybe you fast forward to this generation and say, oh, my God, the wickedness of the world has gotten all the way up to heaven. I've got to do something. I understand it. You know, you look around. There's a lot of bad stuff going on. If you if you pay attention to it, I'd understand it. Yeah. Well, one but thing that, that then, well, the, the the thing that I would just add to that, and it's this is makes it even worse in some ways, is that there is a backstory to that, which the the regular, um, typical Old Testament doesn't include. But the Book of Enoch, have you dove into that yet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Where the, they do give the background to say why is it so bad, and the background was that these fallen angels who had been in heaven right. and fallen. They found you know women too too seductive, so they come and right. procreate and have kids. But that in the process, they're teaching humans all these bad things about um, how to how to do things like cosmetics, but also how to do war. And so the angels are the are the problem. But what's fascinating about it is is you again have this this repeated scenario that I wanted to get into this a little bit later, but of of blaming women for right. it and saying like if if you if you focus more on the Adam and Eve story as the fall. Right. Well, Eve gave Adam the fruit, so Eve was the start starting point of how we all fell. Well, if you if you focus more on Enoch, which is what uh, I think Jews traditionally did, is mm -hmm. you know focus on the fact that the world was deserving of a flood because of these fallen angels, but they the starting point was how it affected humanity was these women were so seductive. Either way, you're kind of blaming women for getting the ball started with these awful things, which is. You know, putting this on women over and over is is a horrible yeah. thing, but then it also brings up the question of, well, wait a second, if if they were in heaven, and heaven's right. a place that's perfect, and I'm headed right. there, and there's right. no sin, but yet right. they fell so much that they just ruined everything, right. and they were angels who did, right. I think don't have a sin nature. Like, how does that work? Right. And it just it, like the, right. it just keeps unraveling. Right. Um, but yeah, I agree. It, it's just in the very basic structure, like. Why would you kill a, a newborn baby in the flood? Like, right. you know, kill the kill the criminals if you want to, kill the rapists right. if God, if that's what you want to do, kill the thieves if that's what you want to do, kill the you know the cannibals if that's what you want to do. But but why are you killing you know babies? You know that just doesn't right. make sense. No sense at all. You know, you made a great analogy about the snakes in the yard and the neighbor next door, the snakes and the hole in the fence. And a beautiful analogy, wonderful. Now I love it. I love analogies like if you, you know, because I think you, you got to, you, you got to create these scenarios, the finger in the, in the fire, you know, the, the hot pan, you got to create these scenarios to give people something to think about. You got to humanize these examples and say, well, you know, again, I wouldn't, I would never do this as a parent. You probably would never do this as a parent, but we're saying that this supposedly good father is going to do this, which is way times worse. But another analogy, <coughs> excuse me. That um that makes sense to me, and I, I put together was um, the devil, Satan. So supposedly, as you you know, you talk about this this heaven being this utopia, this beautiful place, no sin, no problems. But then there's this Satan dude up there where sin starts. Sin started in heaven, according to the narrative. <clears throat> so here's this God who also is supposed to be all knowing. So we got to now backtrack to. Before I create Satan, I already know how this is going to play out. But yeah, you know what? Let me create him anyway, because I'm all knowing. So then we got to backtrack to this God being supposedly all powerful and the creator. Okay, fine. So Satan does whatever Satan does. Now, you mean to tell me that an all powerful God who has the ability to create anything couldn't just create a isolated place for Satan to go to? I'm going to banish you to this isolated place where you never can influence anyone. No, 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 no I didn't do that. Mm -mm. Not smart enough to do that. What this God decided to do was vanquish this evil, dent, evil, uh, the evilness to the earth where his children are going to be. So here's my analogy. It's kind of like saying you and your wife say, Hey, we want to go shopping, but we need someone to watch the kids. You know what? Let's go out. Let's find the, the worst pedophile we can find. Invite them into our home to watch our kids while we go shopping. That's just like that in my mind. That's exactly how that would play out. Now, what parent would get a pass for that? 
You know this person is a horrible pedophile. You know what this person is capable of. And you're going to invite this person into your home to watch your kids while you go shopping? Your kids who you say you love? God's going to send this evil entity down to the earth where his beloved children are going to be? And why are we not pointing the finger back at this God? You know, who made the tree? God. Who put him in the garden? God. Who, <laughs> who made the angels? God. Who saw them falling? God. I mean, you couldn't just, okay, angels who you're falling, gone. They're all seed, they're, they're all spring, gone. You couldn't just do that? So once you humanize these stories and start putting human elements in them, thinking, logic, reason, all these natural things we have, they really start falling apart or at yeah. least make you question some stuff. And then what I think really adds to it is when you take that approach and you say, this doesn't make sense. So you keep digging because you want it to yeah. make sense. You say, right. oh, there's, there's more to this I must be missing. And you find out that a lot of these stories like the the Satan and the and the the fallen angels from Enoch, they're identical to existing stories yes. from ancient Mesopotamia from you yeah. know hundreds or thousands of years earlier. And you're like, okay, wait a second. And again, yeah. you know, mentioned Noah. Now you're looking at the Epic of Gilgamesh and Utnapish team in his right. boat. And mm -hmm. you're like, um, not only do these narratives not make sense if I just take them at face value, right? But now they don't make sense because it looks like you copycatted some other right. Religion, major plagiarism going on. Major, and eventually that. I know we're probably jumping ahead here to, in terms of your story, but when you put those together, eventually, it to me, it's like um, I, I like I used to say this a lot. I haven't said it in a while, but I used to say it like for my deconversion. It was like the you know when you have dominoes lined up and you can tip one and they all fall. It was it was as if the 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 domino, the line of dominoes that needed to fall. It's as if it were a mile away. And so you can kick right now and you're not going to, you're not going to get it to fall because you're not there yet. Right. But you, you're, you don't realize it, but you do investigate Noah and the Epic of Gilgamesh. You do investigate Satan and the fallen angels. And then you go back to earlier stories in Mesopotamia and you start doing this over and over. And eventually you, you don't realize it, but you're, you're walking closer to your worldview dominoes. Yeah. And then you find out maybe one more thing. You're just like, okay, there's one extra thing. For example, um, you know, maybe got the gospel narratives that don't, there's, there's, there's discrepancies. You just can't, right. you can't get past them. Right. And you make one final kick and you feel like you're just making, adding one more thing to the pile, but you don't realize that it, it it's, it's actually, you've been slowly moving toward a spot where you're like, yeah. this doesn't add up anymore. Right. And then you kick it and you're like, holy smokes, what just happened? I just kicked the domino, but they're all falling. Like I thought it was just dealing with gospel discrepancies. Right. But all of a sudden, chips are falling everywhere. And it's it gets to a point where you, it can be very scary if you don't do it slowly because it's like, like you I think I've seen a lot of people do take a lot of time with it. I, I took three years with it. Um, but you have to take time because you you have so much going on in you that if you if you do it quickly, it'll terrify you you're like you know and people sometimes do get depressed over it i, I fortunately was very spared i was fortunately very spared uh, very much spared the depression side of deconversion yeah mm -hmm. but i've seen people where they they realize they put those chips together quickly like they they run that mile i walked yeah. my mile they yeah. walk the mile run the mile kick the dominoes over and they're like super depressed because they're like where's god anymore and they realize they right. accurately he's not there right but the terror of it all is just too much it but is. were you when you're speaking about you being like, you know, going into the, being called into the pastorate by these people, were you already facing any cracks or at this point was, was your faith still fairly strong? Well, it, if I'm honest early on, and so now I'm in my early twenties and I'm being ordained for the first time. I, I went through two ordinations before the pastorship. Um, so I'm 21. I'm being ordained as a minister. <clears throat> what do you and, have to do to be um, ordained by the way? Like what are the requirements? Well, in our in our church, which was we we weren't part of a denomination as far as a, a organization, so we were independent, um, and and so a lot of it was based on our pastor's understanding of how these things happen. So there's order, there's a there's a time of training. You you do some some, some trial sermons, and uh, you have to s sit in front of this board of ministers, and they ask you certain questions, kind of like fundamental faith based questions. 
Um, and, you know, then you get the approval and then they, they all come to Presbury. They come and lay their hands on you and give you a Bible and a cross and a this, that, and the other and charge you for the ministry. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I didn't go to seminary or anything like that. My, my pastor actually was against seminary. He, he believed that your teaching, your learning comes directly from the Holy Spirit. He's, he called it the school of neology, where mm -hmm. on your knees, God teaches you and talks to you and shows you through the Holy Spirit. So it was very heavily based on what we interpreted spiritual events were happening in our lives. God told me, God showed me, God told me, God showed me, the Spirit showed me, my Spirit said, my, you know, so it was a lot of that. Um, so would you and, say there and, wasn't a heavier, in, heavier push towards academics then? Sounds like. No, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a heavy push towards academics at all, which, um, which, you know, sidebar, I think one of the huge problems with religion itself is primarily you don't need any academic training. So here we are, we have massive amounts of people trying to teach people something. But in every other field of teaching, you have to be degreed or you have to have training. So if I'm going to teach people math, I'm going to teach people how to be an electrician or a plumber or whatever, I have to have accredited training myself to be able to teach people these things, except for in ministry. There's no requirement for any type of academic uh, accreditation that you need in order to now be a pastor. Now, of course, seminaries, seminaries exist. And, and my, my personal take on them is I've never found them to be credible or worth anything, in my opinion, only because if you go to one seminary, you get a degree over here, and this person goes to a seminary over there, and they get a degree, but the two doctrines are totally different, then, I mean, what'd you get? <laughs> like, yeah. what'd you get? Like, okay, you got you got a degree in your theology, your doctoral view. This person has one in their doctoral view from the organization, so, like, you could still get together and totally disagree on so many different factors, so, again. Um, and another huge problem I have with religion overall Christianity specifically is anywhere you go in this world, no matter what language you speak, no matter what country, as far as I know, one plus one is always going to be two. So whatever language, however they count and talk or whatever, one plus one is always going to be two. One plus one, not being two is always going to be wrong, no matter where you go. That, that's, that's universal. It's, it's consensusly known everywhere. Christianity doesn't have one consensus belief that every part and facet of Christianity agrees on unilaterally. There's nothing like that at all. So again, I mean, once you realize this, and if this is supposed to be something given to us from a God, that, hey, this is what I want you to have, there should be some unilateral consistency somewhere. I mean, there's people that don't, agree on what God is. There's people that don't agree on what Jesus is. I mean, there's some people believe Jesus, Christians that believe Jesus was real. Some people, some Christians believe Jesus was allegory. And these are the two biggest parts of the whole story. Hmm. So like, you know, when you, when you start to, again, those dominoes, these dominoes are falling and you're going further down the road. And for me, it was probably a seven to 10 year journey of, you know, deconstructing because I was so deeply in it. Now hmm. I'm 21 now being ordained. And, I, and, and, I, and sometimes people say, well, you were never really saved. And because I, I'm, inst I get that a lot on TikTok through my videos. Well, you were never, you were never a Christian. You're never really saved. And I laugh at that comment because you have no idea of my story. And not only was I saved, but I was what I believed. I was Holy Ghost filled, tongue talking. Um, I studied the Bible daily. I prayed, like we believed in prayer. I was 21 years old, 19, well, I started about 19, I started this, because this is when I started my getting serious with God at 19. I was 19 years old. I would come home from work, go straight to my room, fall on my knees and pray for an hour every day, 19 years old. Hmm. Um, by the time I'm in, getting ready to be ordained in the ministry, this whole thing had consumed me. Prayer, fasting, 
Bible study, every aspect and facet of my life was God, 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 everything. That's all I talked about. That's all I did. Me and another young minister, we came up together. That's all we did. We would sit and talk for hours daily about God. We would get together Bible studying daily for hours. I mean, we, we would pray together. I had my own personal prayer regiment. He had his prayer regiment. We would get together and go down to the church a couple of days a week and just have our own little prayer time, just trying to get that power, trying to get God, trying to understand this whole thing. So a lot of people have no clue of how deeply committed I was. And I tell people, I probably have prayed more than most people have would even consider praying. You know, um, mm. this was my life. This was everything. And, and I considered myself to be a incredibly strong and faithful and dedicated Christian. I'll probably talk a little bit more about that soon, about how I fell so deeply into it that it became everything. I gave up every aspect of who I was and what I wanted to do with my life that I imagined as a kid to follow this idea that God was the head of my life, that my life was in his hands, that he was in control and that I needed to follow his plan. And I did things that are completely illogical, especially when I came to the word of faith camp. And I looked at my life at this point in 2007 and said, this is why nothing has worked so far because I've never really come to a place to fully trust the word. And then I built my whole life on the word of faith, confessing scripture, believing God, standing in faith, trying to live by faith, not working, trying to honor God by being full time while losing everything around me, committing everything I had to this, everything going to, to put, you know, to everything going to chaos in my natural life, but standing on the word, confessing scriptures every day, uh, you know, just God, I won't quit. I won't stop. I trust you. I'm going to believe you. Your word is powerful. Your word is true. Your word won't return to me void. I mean, countless of scriptures, 20 minutes every morning, confessing scriptures, another 20 minutes, listening to spoken words that have been spoken to me, you know, again, getting into prayer every day, doing this. And I had stories. I mean, I have stories of so many illogical things I did because I took the path that said, I'm going to trust God. I'm going to believe God. I'm going to stand on God's word because God can't fail. And when I mentioned earlier that this approach destroyed most of my adult life, well, that's exactly what it did. Because when I finally woke up out of that stupor, I realized that I had committed my entire adult life to this and I had nothing to show for it. Literally nothing mm -hmm. to show for it. And then people say, well, you were in it for the wrong reason. I wasn't in it for the wrong reason. I was in it because I expected this God who had, I thought, told me all these things was going to keep its word, that it was going to perform its word, prosper me, bless me, increase me, do the things that it said it would do if I followed it, trusted it, believed it. But it didn't. And I came to the conclusion that it couldn't because it wasn't real. And that's just a little snippet, so. Well, there's so much here to unpack. One word that comes to mind that's been levied at me for sure when I was a Christian, I'd imagine you you would relate to it as the word of obsessive. Um, yeah. This, the religion demands obsession. It would frame it very differently. Obviously, it would frame it as a you're in a love relationship. And just like yeah. you, you know, if Emotion. you were, you know, engaged to a you know young lady to be married, there, there's no part of you that would say, well, if I show her kindness or, or love or affection or attention. That's not obsessive. That's just me loving this person who's right there. They're, they're part of my life now. Yeah. We're going to spend our lives together. You know, of course, I'm going to do everything I can to, to, to build up this relationship. Um, it, it wouldn't be considered obsessive. It'd be considered normal. And in a similar way, you're doing that with God. And how much more important is it to spend time with him and build up yeah. that relationship? But when you realize, like you're saying, it's not real, you you realize that what was effectively happening was you were being sucked into an obsessive 
uh, worldview that says, give me everything, give me all your thoughts, take your thoughts captive for Christ. Um, you know, uh, Romans 12, one and two, he's going to transform you. Like, and, and if he's, he's going to turn you from Kyle, the, the, the pagan Kyle, the sinner into Kyle, the righteous uh, child of God, then you need to be in the word so that he has the tools and the spirit has the tools to transform you. But like, this isn't like Easter and Christmas and Easter, like this is every minute of every day. And so it becomes very obsessive. And then when you mix into it, the whole community aspect we've talked about, like everybody around you is encouraging you saying, go Kyle, go Kyle, you're doing good. And you end up at a point where the more that you do, the more it almost, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy in some ways for, for some of us in that you you begin to see or at least you think you see god everywhere you begin to oh god opened up a door here i got open right, he, he right. answered my prayer here you see mm-hmm. god and so it just it pushes you to say oh see i i this was good this was good and or maybe you're you know a guy struggling with porn and he's, he's in the word and oh i haven't been struggling with that this week see god is transferring my heart and you you get to the point where you're like i i have this has to consume me it has to consume my mind and I love how you're putting it. Like it, eventually though, it doesn't, it, some cracks appear and it doesn't add up. It's, right. it really messes with your mind. And I, I think one of the hardest parts for me when I escaped was realizing that there are people, it could have been you and me, but there are people who will struggle with those cognitive dissonance questions, but they will never entertain just one pot. Like right. there's, there's many possibilities, right? Things aren't adding up. So Number one, maybe I'm I'm misinterpreting scripture. Number two, it's a cultural differences. If I could understand what ancient Israel thought, and you know, I'd, I'd my interpretation would be correct. Maybe I'm just straight up being selfish and sinful. You know, the Bible talks about you know you've got hidden sins, presumptuous sins. Maybe there's a part of me that just is is clinging to the world too much. All these ideas, but very few people, in my experience who are in it that deep entertain just the one thought of maybe the reason it doesn't add up is because this is mythology yeah. and it's not real. It's, it's a fantasy. It's a delusion. And I felt like it, almost within probably the first week of my deconversion, I, I wasn't depressed myself, but I felt very depressed for other people thinking, for example, like in Bible college, I knew the guy struggled like crazy crazy with their thought lives about, you know, sexual thoughts. And they felt so defeated all the time. Like I can never be pure enough. I'm pure for a week. And then I feel like, oh, you know, they, they masturbate and think, oh, I've let God down. I'm such a wicked person. And they're in this, doing this hamster wheel of like, I'm obeying God. I let them down. I'm back again. I let Mm -hmm. them down. And I think there are people who will literally go to their graves on that cycle and never break free. And I was like, yeah, that's so depressing. That's so it's sad. Incredibly depressing. So sad. It's debilitating. It's traumatic. I mean, how do you reconcile the idea that you are failing a God? Yeah. That you can't get it together for God, for Jesus who gave you everything, who put, who sacrificed its life for you. Surely you can sacrifice this because that's the narratives we often heard. You can't give up this for God. He and every sin is like you're pounding you. the nail in, you know? Right, exactly. Um, and so I remember for myself, I lived with tremendous condemnation and guilt for years over many things. I've never been married. So you can only imagine the struggle I had as a pastor being single. I'm a, I'm a you know, and, it, it, and I'm not trying to be graphic here, but I think it's a reality I don't know a boy alive, including Jesus, if he did exist, that didn't masturbate. I, I can't imagine a boy never masturbating. Um, it's it's an I think it's a natural part of every little boy's teenage beginning. I mean, it's, it's you don't and no one teaches you how to do it. You just instinctively know to do it. One day you wake up with a heart on or from a wet dream, you go, oh, what was that about? You know, and then you you know, next thing you know, you're you know. And I, and, and I think that's a natural thing. It's, it's as natural as breathing is. And sometimes I, I throw that narrative out there and people get really aggravated. Jesus never masturbated. What are you talking about? If he, was a, if he was a 12, 13 year old boy. I guarantee you it did. Trust me. If he was a human being, I mean, I can't see no way around it here. I can't, you know, anyway, 
But um, so you can imagine how difficult it was for me um, because fornication was, of course, considered a sin. And just a sidebar on that, um, the word fornication, as you learn later on, as you start to do the research, the real research, not the Bible, but research, you, you, you later find out that that word did not exist and it did not mean what it's been taught to believe, sex outside of marriage. Uh, it was, it was uh, really talking about um, in this first initial first mention was uh, priests would bring in hordes of prostitutes to the temple and they would have these orgy type uh, religious ceremonies in the temple. That's what the rage was against. You know, they were using this quote, holy place for this impure act, they, they called it. So it was first used in that light. But of course, you know, religion and Christianity took it over to use it in the purity culture to something to control people and c- incredibly mess up the minds of people. I had a long, I, I battled with the, the enjoyment of sex for a long, long time because I'd been so programmed to believe that sex is bad and it's wrong and it's nasty and God's not pleased. And, and even, and I can't even see how once you get married, that goes away. There's, there are married couples today struggling that grew up in a purity culture that, that is struggling their sex life today and still feel dirty and still feel guilty for having now what's, what would be considered in the eyes of their God legalized sex. And this is, again, people don't understand how deeply uh, intrusive this stuff is and how deeply it gets inside of you. And, and I found for myself, Tim, even though consciously I'd broken free from most of the narratives, subconsciously and unconsciously, a lot of that deep stuff was still controlling a lot of my behavior. And it took me years to recognize that I was still under the control of what had been so deeply implanted in me, even though consciously I, I thought I was, you know, I was free from it. <laughs> Why would a God care who's having sex? I mean, we're consenting adults for crying out loud. Come on, really? You got nothing better to do, <laughs> you know? So consciously I broken free from it, but subconsciously deep down inside, I was, I still feel guilty. I still feel ashamed. And like, like God's looking down at me right now, so displeased. And it took years to break away from some of that stuff. And there's still some, every so often, I, another little piece will come up and say, oh boy, I, I didn't know that was still there, it's still affecting my daily life in some ways. Hmm. But that's just how deep this stuff is. And it's, it's a tool of control, a tool of manipulation. And as I say this as a, when I was a pastor, pastors get up and they view their congregation. And... <clears throat> If they see something they don't like, something's out of order, whatever, that pastor gets up and, you know, God's not pleased with so-and-so-and-so, whatever the situation is. And now they're going to frame God into their own personal bias or what, what upsets them. Now they're going to make it a God thing. So now God's not happy about this. God's not pleased about this. God, 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 God. When in fact, and in truth is, you're the one bothered by it. You're the one with the issue with it, but you need the backing of God in order to scare, control, and manipulate the people. And that's, that's religion at its best, which is its worst for people, but that's really what it does. And I think too, just adding one of that, the idea that the God character is not just watching you to make sure you stay in line, but that he's actually got like, he's in your mind. He can see your thoughts like a divine north korea but instead of them just having you know cameras everywhere and making sure you're in line like there's a divine north korea in your head and like it really is it's control at the thought level like a thought police are in your head yeah and it it does it and you realize too when you escape that like because of that constant surveillance mentality like Mm -hmm. i'm constantly on camera yeah before the courts of heaven god's watching perhaps the angels are watching you know but the, the divine presence is there seeing you um seeing you make bad choices seeing you choose to not obey seeing you to do things in your head and they're they're judging you constantly and the idea that there's a book even that's where what you do and even what you say jesus says you'll be condemned even for the words you say um that the, the the very thoughts of your mind the words of your mouth are being written down and that someday those books will be open and you will be judged yeah. And even though you 
might cling to the gospel of like, you know, my, my hope is not in what's written in that book. My hope is Jesus, you know, that Jesus died in my place and rose again, but you still have this constant sense of everything I do is being recorded. Um, and to live that way for years, decades yeah. Yeah. is, is a, it's a horrible, it's, I mean, it literally is like North Korea. So it's a great illustration that other people have come up with. Um, I was curious when you, we've talked a little bit about like struggles as a man, but I was curious how your church dealt with the issue of patriarchy and misogyny, those kinds of issues. And how did you deal with them as you were, you know, both going into ministry and also, uh, you know, beyond that, what was that like for, for the whole um, Pentecostal holiness group? And, and what was it like in your, your specific church and family? Did you feel like men were in charge? Did you feel like women needed to obey the leadership of men, the headship of men, or did it, was it, you know, and that's like my background is more that, but was it a little different for you all? Yeah. Well, patriarchy and, and misogynist, misogynistic views were not very dominant in my church. Okay. Uh, primarily because we had a lot of women, you know, so, you know, it, and it, it, you know, when I was coming up in this young staff of ministers, it was the pastor, uh, myself, who was, was now the assistant pastor to him. And the, the other gentleman I spoke of a little bit earlier, it was him, you know, kind of next to me, uh, one other guy, but the rest of the staff were all women. So the women outnumbered the men. Hmm. Now so there the women was pastors. Yeah. Well, we had some, we had some women ministers, um, okay. along with it. There was one pastor, you know, then there was women ministers with us and all, you know, were active and, and things like that. So in our church, we didn't have any real misogynistic views or patriarchy, but th there was an understanding of who the who the man of God was, and, yeah. and you know there was an understanding there. Now we would fellowship and socialize with other churches and and have services with other churches that pastors did have a very misogynistic patriarchal view of women, where if you know let's say we were doing a revival with a certain church in that viewpoint. Um, when you know we would go preach there we would be able to stand up in the pulpit but if a woman was going to come from our group and preach he would bring a little platform down on the floor and they would have to stand there they were not allowed in the pulpit so he was very very patriarchal that way um but another thing too when i became the pastor see i had made some decisions if once i submitted to the idea that it had to be a pastor i said i'm not going to do a lot of stuff i saw growing up I wasn't going to be hard on the people. I wasn't going to preach about sin. I wasn't going to, to do a lot of stuff that this didn't make sense to me. Um, although I was very performance driven, got to pray a lot. You got to fast a lot. You got to trust God a lot. You know, it was very performance driven. I, I was also very, I, I tried to be an encourager. I, I tried to give hope. I tried to give a sense of, listen, yeah, I know you got issues. I got issues too, but, you know, we're going to try to figure this out the best way we can. Uh, I, I knew I didn't want to beat the people up. I knew that. I knew I couldn't beat the people because I just looked at my own life and said, man, you got some stuff going in your life. So you can't be a hypocrite up there. You, you can't do that because God's going to expose you. And you're going to be in trouble. <laughs> so um, I was awesome. very, very, um, very conventional in a lot of things that I did. I didn't preach hell. I didn't. I talked about the rapture maybe twice in my whole tenure as a pastor. I, mm. I just tried to again, I, I just try to bring hope because I just didn't get much of it growing up. And I just thought it had to be a better way. Now, although the messages I preach, I tried my best and I thought I was doing the best I could. I'd still look back on them all and say, Ugh, that was all nonsense. <laughs> in terms of just getting to back to your timeline, what, when you were, you were in ministry for how long again? At from, from uh, 21. Um, so about, oh, a little over 20 years. Okay. At what point would you say that the cracks that you would, I mean, I, if you're like me, you can kind of look back and say there were actually were yeah. some earlier cracks, but I right. didn't see them as that. But what would you say was when the first cracks began to appear where you could say, looking at it now, those were like the pre-foundational issues where mm -hmm. this wasn't deconversion. It wasn't even close to it, but right. it, it it began the very slow journey toward you know, like that illustration of like the, the, the one mile walk to your dominoes. 
that's when it started. I started taking, you know, baby steps toward those dominoes. What's, what was that? What was that like? And what, what happened? Yeah. 2007 was when I had what I thought was an aha moment where it was, okay, Kyle, you need to trust, you need to learn how to trust the word and stand on God's word. You had never done this before. Um, and, and so it was, it was this great emphasis on now how to trust God's words, find God's word that fits a situation and learn how to one digest it enough that it becomes your belief system. So, you know, um, my God shall supply all my needs or, um, you know, I'm blessed coming in and blessed going out. Uh, you know, the, the, the blessing of the Lord maketh rich, whatever it is. I'm the Lord that God that healeth thee. Um, I'm the head and not the tail, you know, they that wait upon the Lord shall not. So whatever scriptures that I can find that spoke about what the life I wanted to have and the life that God was able to provide through his word, I dove myself into the word of faith camp, uh, Creflo and Kenneth and Jesse and all those guys and, and just, just consume myself with faith-based stuff. And I thought, okay, this must be the answer because nothing has worked so far. If, you know, now I'm trusting God's word, this has got to work. So that started changing some of the performance-based stuff. If I'm going to do this by faith, then I don't need to pray as much and fast as much because I'm doing it by faith based on the word. And then that led me into the grace camp. And then once I learned grace, I thought, aha, Eureka, this is what it's all really been about. It's all about grace of the finished work of the cross and da, 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 da. So I dove into that and became a grace preacher, preached grace and taught grace and felt like, you know, I was really helping people get out of that performance mindset and that burdensome mindset and that, no, 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 this is all about grace and what Jesus has done at the cross and is finished and the curse has been broken. So I, I, dove into grace. And as I dove into grace, that's when the crack started. Because mm -hmm. I would hear things that were grace based, and it would totally violate all the head knowledge I had about a topic. But I decided early on that I'm going to follow what I hear inside. And so that's when those cracks started. And then eventually that grace camp started falling apart, because now it made less sense to me as I started what I thought understanding unconditional love. And when the unconditional love piece came in, then that's when the hell and the rapture and all the, those heavy, heavy, you know, aspects of Christian belief started falling apart because I thought there's no way unconditional love can send somebody to hell. That didn't make no sense whatsoever. Um, and so then grace then became nothing more than the, 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 you know, the law with lipstick on it in my mind. Like grace, that's a garbage. That is, that's nothing. That's just another way to keep people in, in, in working. <clears throat> Then unconditional love came on the scene. And it was through that the final cracks opened up the whole picture for me. Um, because I still couldn't fully get this God that was unconditional, loving, and all powerful. But like you said, okay, if you're gonna watch me for bad stuff, but you're also watching other things going on, well, why aren't you helping with me? Why aren't you doing anything about the good stuff I do? Because I do a lot of good stuff. <laughs> You know, if you're so quick to watch the bad and get me for the bad, what about the good stuff that I do? I've been serving you and giving to you and, and, and you know, just pouring my whole life into you all my life. And I've got nothing to show for it. Um, and so that's it, it all started back in 2007, you know, the, the cracks. And by mm -hmm. the time 2014, 15 came along, I still was 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 Jesus based and God based. But my theology had drastically changed from um, anything I had known prior. And I really talked, I spent a lot of, a couple of years really heavy on unconditional love and we're all accepted and a universalist type message. Um, Can I ask, did that scare you at all? Like the idea of what they would have called a slippery slope? No, Your theology it me. Kind made of... me feel better. Made me feel better because I had been in the other end of it. I had mm -hmm. been in the performance and I had been in the, it's up to me and what I do and how much I pray and how much I fast and how much I study and, and how good I am. I'd been in that and it, it hadn't produced anything. It hadn't produced anything. I mean, it would be one thing if it had produced something like, okay, well, you know what? I've been a good Christian. I prayed a lot. I fasted a lot. I, I did a lot of work for the Lord. I've been faithful because a lot of the driving force had always been for me, as I was taught, if you'll be faithful to God, God will be faithful to you. And if you yep. just keep on doing what you're doing, one day God will bless you. And so you kept waiting for that one day to happen. Like, okay. And you, you mentioned something earlier that I was very familiar with. One day I just asked the question, 
either God is incredibly slow at returning his blessings to people, or I'm doing something incredibly wrong. It has to be one or the other. And when I thought it was me doing it wrong, I did everything I can do to try to correct that, but still nothing. Hmm. And then the, the bigger question came, is any of it real? Um, I had a dear friend um, who had developed cancer. And this is when I was really heavy on the word. And I would go sit with her and, and tell her, listen, here's the word. This is what the word says. And I give her books like from Charles Capps, little confessions of faith. He called them the medicine. And, I, you know, really pouring to her the power of God's word and God's word can't fail. And, you know, I, my word will not return to me void. And, you know, I'm the Lord, that God that healed thee. And I'm you know, really encourage her to trust God and trust the word and you can't fail. And this is God's word and God won't fail you. Well, she died from cancer. And I remember many times she would call me with tears in her eyes saying, Carl, I'm trusting God. I'm going to keep trusting God. I'm going to keep standing on the word and things are getting worse, but I'm just, I'm not going to quit. I'm going to keep trusting God. And I said, yes, sister, that's, that's right. I'm with you, sister. I'm with you. Don't, don't give up. Don't quit on the word because it's God's word and God's word can't fail. And she died. And to this day, that still bothers me. It still gets me choked up because what did, what could I say after that? And I, I acknowledged that it wasn't working in my life. I, I, well, I came to acknowledge later on that the word didn't work for me. But when she died, that really sent me into a tailspin of questioning because she was a young mother, a you know, fairly new wife. She had a family that depended on her. And I mm. thought, God, you couldn't do this one. Like, I, I didn't understand it. You couldn't do this one. And then you know, the, the old thoughts would come and hit me. Well, maybe she just really didn't have faith. But then my logic kicked in and said, how much faith does it take for someone to want to be healed? Like, what are we talking about here? Like, you want to be better? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> like, it's like what, what, what kind of faith should that be? So that really shook me. And that asked, really the, sent me questioning. Did the issue of, not the issue, but the, um, the idea of not necessarily with, with that friend in particular, but just people in general who were facing mm -hmm. hardship or death, the idea that this is what God wants, um, maybe for people that were dying, the idea of saying like, God wants you home. Like you've, you've, this is your journey. He didn't have more than 25, 30 years for you. This is what his plan was. Or for the people, maybe it was just more hardships to say like, like, look, you need to be in the mindset that says, God, my hands are open. You give and take away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. If you choose to give me funds to, to have a you know successful life, if you choose to keep me impoverished, um, whatever, if you choose this, choose that, I am not here to do anything except simply praise your name and to say, God, I will actively ask you to please do whatever you know as the omniscient God, you know what it will what it will take for me to be holy. And if for me to be holy, I need to be you know, I need to not be married, or if I need to be holy, I need to be poor. I need to struggle with something. Use that. It's kind of like Paul talks about his thorn in the flesh and he prays to God, yeah. God, take it away. But God, God, you know, kept it there. Like how did, how did your and your church's theology work with, with that mentality of like, God, I want you more than any earthly blessing. Um, the things of this earth will, you know, fade away or however that song goes. Um, but I want to focus on your glory, including through you depriving and even hurting me. And I think Job talks about, though he slay me, yet I will then trust him. Trust him. Yeah. How did you deal with with that kind of aspect of it? Yeah. See, uh, that was it. Never made any sense to me because in the church I grew up in, um, the pastor believed in healing, so I had that foundational background. He believed in healing; that God will heal you. You believe God, God will heal. He had testimonies and he'd talk about different things of when he would pray and what God would do. So I kind of grew up in that environment. Now, also like real in that miracles. environment, yeah. Uh, also in that environment, we did have a very strong understanding that you're going to go through trials and tribulations. You're going to face trials and tribulations. You're going to be attacked by the devil and all those kind of things. So we kind of knew that those things were going to happen. But the overwhelming belief is that God will deliver us 
deliver us from them all. You know, I am more than a conqueror. Uh, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. So we, we believe the weapons will be formed and will be used against us, but they won't prosper. They won't, they won't succeed. We may feel the, the stab or the sword or the heat of the press, but it won't, it won't accomplish what the devil meant for evil. God took what the devil meant for evil and turned it into good. So we didn't believe that, you know, life would be perfect in the sense of nothing, but we did believe that because we sung songs and believed that Jesus was our savior and our deliverer and you would deliver us. So I had that as a very strong foundational belief that if something were to happen, if a trial were to come, if the devil did attack, that God will come in when the enemy comes in like a flood, God will lift up a standard against it those kind of things that God would deliver us. And to excuse this God for not showing up, then we would come up with those other lame excuses. Well, I guess God had a better plan. Well, I guess God, you know, uh, they'll get their healing on the other side. And none of those things ever made sense to me. Hmm. Like, there's always a way somebody to need healing in heaven for? They're freaking going to heaven. What are they healing yeah. over there for? You know, it didn't make any sense to me. There's always a way to explain that stuff. Why it's crazy yeah. how that works. It's crazy, right? right. I, I'm thinking of parallel too is the Lord's will. Um, yeah. You know, does God want you to go to college A or college B? Right. Well, He's He's put it on my heart that college A is the one for me. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, the door shut. Um, they didn't accept you. Okay. Well, this this is this is either Satan, or mm -hmm. it's the Lord testing you and saying you need to keep asking, keep sending yeah. letters saying I really want to go to college A, and you can go back and forth and you're just like, is it my lack of faith? Is it Satan? Is it God saying, no, don't go to college. I just, I clearly just shut the door. Don't yeah. do it. I'm clearly guiding you to college B, but he put it on your, put, put it on your heart. So maybe he's actually just testing you. How much do right. you want it? And yeah. there, there's, there's so many ways to explain this away. And it always ends up leaving God is good. God is in charge. And you as the person that's just constantly saying, God, please throw me a bone. Please send me some kind of scrap to let me know if I'm on yeah. the right track. And you yeah. end up being, I mean, in my opinion, you end up feeling like a dog begging for scraps constantly. Yeah. Yeah. And when God finally throws you a bone, you're like, oh, this is wonderful. God's so good. It's like, yeah, mm, yeah. no, so it's just, you're just, you're just doing gymnastic, mental gymnastics yeah. here. Yeah. Why are we always gaslighting ourselves and being gaslit? Why is it always our fault? God is the power. God is the source. Why is it always our fault? Like, okay, it's, it's my fault I didn't have enough faith. It's my fault I didn't pray enough. It's my fault I didn't hear God clearly. So this God couldn't just make it abundantly clear that this is what he wanted me to do, like abundantly clear, like a, 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 the example about God has prepared a wife for you. At no other time in my entire adult life did anyone ever come back and say, okay, God told you when you were 16, he had a wife prepared for you. Now, let me give you more information. So you're not confused. So you're not out here wondering and, and in this state of ultimate frustration because you can't really know. You can't really figure it out. Did God send this one or did the devil send this one? There was never any follow-up, never any clarity. So let's just say I had married someone and it ended up being the wrong person. Then I would have been open to, not open like willing, but like open to like, here's a target on me of someone saying, didn't God tell you at 16 he had prepared a wife for you? Would you go out there and marry this other woman for I would have been like, yeah, you're right. Yeah, he told me I picked the wrong one. But there was never any follow-up from this God with more, more valid information. Okay, Kyle, when you're 23, you're going to meet a woman named Sarah, and she's going to be the one now. Just kind of watch and observe how I put things together, but you're going to know because, remember, her name's going to be Sarah. You're going to be 23. That, that God couldn't tell me that? It, 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 that information, what, is, is, escaped that God? So and tell Sarah too, of, so she knows. Yeah, yeah, tell Sarah she's gonna know. I'm gonna know, and like we're gonna know because this is what God has prepared. Like, isn't that what a plan does? It's supposed to unfold and give you the details. You were a cabinet maker, so you get the schematics of okay, this customer wants these dimensions, and so you got the plan in front of you. So if you mess it up, who's who's getting paid? You mess it up. No, I'm not paying for that. That's not what the plan said. Well, you, yeah, you're right. So, you, you know, you didn't, the customer, no one hires you, said, just make whatever you want, <laughs> whatever you want. I'll take whatever you make. We don't have any plans. I don't want to just waste my time. You might not like them. So 
you know, again, we're going to be the ones gaslit, though. We're going to gaslight ourselves or we're going to be gaslit by others telling us that it was our fault. We messed up. We didn't do enough. We failed. Mm-hmm. When all the while, this God had all the power and all the wisdom, and all the knowledge to give us all the details and, and whatever we needed to make the plan come together. You said, you know, the plans you have for us to prosper us, to bring us to an expected end. Okay, well, why are we always in the dark? Well, I don't know if that's God's will or not. <laughs> like it just makes no sense. Uh, what you're saying, I've, I've got so much, it's like there's so many little scatter plot things going on in my, in my head right now. But I was going to ask before I get into some other things that are, you're making me think of, did it ever, as you're thinking through this stuff, like, like this doesn't make sense, that doesn't make sense. Why doesn't God just whatever the whole phrase, why doesn't God just blank? The the biggest one that I came across that in my mind that was the most impactful to me was why does God need a sacrifice? Why does he need blood? And because it talks about like God says, if you as a human don't forgive others, then I won't forgive you. So Right. So we clearly have the ability to forgive others. We're required to forgive others, according to Jesus. But we don't require a sacrifice. You know, if somebody offends us, we can just say simply, I forgive you. And we don't say, but, you know, that's dependent on if you give me 20 shekels of silver, you give me a, you know, a, a goat that you can kill. There's no requirement. I can just freely give it. But then the God character is described as saying, I also can forgive you, but my biggest requirement is a human sacrifice, which is mm-hmm. quite a interesting concept that, that the God that's fighting against, you know, these other tribes that did include like, especially child sacrifice, human sacrifice to appease the God. And he says, you know, these other false religions are, are doing human sacrifice to appease their pagan gods, their idols. We're different. We're completely different. By the way, the pinnacle story is going to be human sacrifice is going to save the day. Um, that's a bizarre thing, but like the idea of God can't, even if before that, like with, with the sheep and the goats, God can't right. do it without blood. It says without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. Right. And the idea of, and, and even that it, it delights God, like when you do the sacrifice and you burn it, it's a, it's a savor. Uh, it's an, yeah. it's a it's sweet, beautiful yeah. offering to him. Mm-hmm. And the idea that God cannot forgive you without blood, without sacrifice, especially ultimately human sacrifice, um, I would call it now blood magic, but you know, like he can't yeah. do this. And it did like, did it ever hit you as you, as you started to think through this stuff? Like, why can't he just say, I forgive you. End of story. Yeah. Like he writes the rules, right? He's in charge. Yeah. He makes yeah. the rules. He writes the handbook. Mm-hmm. So why mm-hmm. can't his handbook just say, I don't need blood. Just please be yeah. serious. Seriously confess your sins. Say you're going to really stop hurting each other or whatever, killing each other. And yeah, I'll forgive you. Yeah. Like, yeah, you know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I I, I, I just did a TikTok about that. Um, Could I like to put stuff like that out there to give people something to think about? Right. And that's a very interesting thought to, to put out to people to think about. Why would a God need blood, especially blood ending in the death of another person? Why would a God need this? And it's clearly a need based upon the Christian narrative. It's a need, again, without the shedding of, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. So it's a need to this God. This God needs blood. This God needs blood in order to forgive. Whereas you said, we as humans, we need nothing. I don't even need your consent. I don't even need your apology. I don't even need you to acknowledge that you offended me. I need nothing to forgive you. Nothing. And I have the power to do it just like that. And, but this looks like you're better than God. <laughs> yeah, we're better than God. God, and we're, we're smarter. We're much smarter. So I, I can't, I'm not going to come to you, Tim, and say, Tim, you, you really offended me. Uh, give me your son. We're smarter than God because we know that's, that's wrong. That's not right. Because I don't, no one's going to come take my son if, well, if I had a son. Yeah, no, no, you're not going to get my son. Stay mad. I don't care. I don't need your forgiveness. No, you're not getting my son. I don't care if you forgive me. It's ridiculous. But this, and 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 it it, it was it's amazing to me again. And I understand it, so I'm not judging how Christians would come and try to spin the the black and white reality of this. I just did a recent TikTok where 
I read Isaiah 53, chapter verse 10, chapter 53, verse 10, where it says, and it pleased God to beat Jesus. Mm. It pleased God. And my, my summary was, what a loving father, huh? Like you saw the passion of the Christ. You saw what, how they depicted, how it possibly could have looked like. I mean, go to your Bible. Your Bible tells a pretty graphic story by itself. God is, well, I'm, I like this. <laughs> Boy, this is good. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Woohoo. Uh, by I the mean, way, there's you mentioned wrong with that. There is. You mentioned TikTok. I'll have a link beneath our video for anyone that wants to check you out your, your channel there. Yeah. Did, you, did you ever hear of the Dan Barker's little spiel about you don't have to go down to my basement? Do you know that no, one? It. It's really it good. It's somewhat familiar. I'll put a link for it. It's it's a part of a, it's like a, he does a 45 minute presentation, but it's like five minutes of it. Um, but he basically says, if you're walking by somebody's house, you know, and just taking a walk and the guy says, hey, come here. I want to tell you something really cool. I've got some good news for you. And you go over and start chatting with him. He's like, you don't have to go down to my basement. You're like, what are you talking about? I don't have to go down into your basement. And he says, yeah, well, I, I've been calling to you every day when you walk by here and you have, you've ignored me. And I was so angry. I made this horrible basement with chains and hooks and hot lava stuff and tar. But you know what? I sent my son down there instead of you. And he, I, I, you know, I cut him up and stuff. So, you know, so now you can come, come live with me in my attic, <laughs> you know, and, you know, cause I, you don't have to go to my basement, but it's, it's really is true. It's like, That's this good. God is so sadic, sadistic and, yeah. and punishing. And it, the idea that he needs to hurt people, either hurt, hurt his son, like you're saying with that verse or hurt you is it, just, it's, it's beyond crazy. And I think one of the things I'd want to get, make sure I got to, um, as we're talking about human sacrifice and stuff is the idea of the Lord's table. Um, did that ever bother you as you're starting to deconvert? Like what's actually happening in that? I mean, I assume the, the yeah. Pentecostal church did something similar to ours with the, yeah. the wafers and the grape juice or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, did that become part of your story at all? Thinking through what in the world is going on here? Yeah. You know what? When I, when I got into the grace camp and really dove into grace, because through the long journey, you're, you're consistently looking for something that's going to work because nothing has worked so far. There's been no breakthrough. There's been no manifestation. There's been no blessings. There's been no God showing up. There's been no real tangible manifestations of the promises being fulfilled. You're still working. And like you said earlier, you're trying to label little small things as, oh, this is God working. Oh, this is God blessing. Oh, this is God doing it. When in fact, it's not at all. It's just life and time and things happening. But uh, when I got into the grace camp very heavily, it was another moment like, aha, I know what I'm missing. I'm missing daily communion. We should be doing this every day because again, this is, this is saying we put what Jesus did above everything. And so for one season, I got very heavy into communion every day. Now we would do communion before, but it was always a guilt felt thing because our pastor taught us that very famous verse that if any of you drink or eat unworthily, he would, he would stress that. And it was a fear-based thing through most of my life growing up in church until I, I, I wouldn't, I never emphasized that part myself. I just tried to emphasize in the first part, but then later on during the journey of the dominoes falling the deconstruction, the rethinking, the, the looking at things logically and uh, with intellectual honesty, it was like, here we are again. You know, this, this ritualistic, sadistic ritual that in any other way would be considered witchcraft or voodoo-ish or something. And we Christians would be condemning this act, mm -hmm. violently condemning this act. Yeah. But because it's with our little precious Jesus, it's the same type of voodoo-ish, you know, witchcraft-based act that we would condemn with others but because it's our precious jesus oh okay this is okay no and it's only symbolic yeah no there's, there's people that preach it's not symbolic you need to close your eyes and see yourself eating the precious body of the lord that was broken for you this is where your healing comes from this is where your deliverance comes from this is where your wholeness comes from and you need to see this as God's blood. This is where your redemption, your cleansing, your forgiveness, see it as it, because he did.
did it for you. And this is his. This is what he said. It's his. You actually have to visualize yourself eating his body because it's going to make you whole. And when sickness comes against you, it's going to fight off the sickness and his blood, which is cleansing you and washing you and keeping you purified. It's a, it's a pretty disgusting concept. And even when it's just symbolic, like for the a lot, lot more of the Protestant denominations, it's still symbolic of, of a version of cannibalism. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting how, to me, how, like how much um, of Dionysius and other gods too, but Dionysius is woven into so much of the gospels, starting of course with, um, you know, the big, big one of, of Jesus turning water into wine, but you see it um, in other stories, you see it, uh, see it, uh, from the the Bacchae and Zacchaeus and Zacchaeus the story with the tree, um, you know Bacchae Zacchae, that that one is pretty cool. But when you look at the the Dionysius cults, you had these people, the 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 people that were following him, usually I think women, who he had put under this spell, and they, they were they were going out and and ripping apart animals and people and eating them, you know, eating their their flesh and blood, as kind of these crazy savages that were under Dionysius's spell, and so. You know, Dionysus is woven through this whole thing. And then the Jesus character comes along and says, you know, having been like Dionysius in so many other ways, turning water into wine and, and all these other icons that, that they copied from, all of a sudden he says, by the way, just like, you know, you're used to hearing the Dionysius stories, I, I do want you to eat flesh and drink blood, but it's it's mine. Even if you take it as a symbol now, you're still pretend to, pretending to eat a dead body. And I've, I've said this to people, like if going to the idea of like a, an illustration, if you were to, to say to your, your friends or family, hey, I'm making a meal for you. And it's my friend, you know, or whatever, uncle so-and-so died last week. And I'm going to put, you know, you're going to get his arm, you're going to get his leg. Like, even if, even if I was to just put it on the table and say, would you like to eat it? And you said, no, the, the fact that it's even an option would obviously put me in jail really quickly. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's bizarre. Like it's sick. It's yeah. a version of cannibalism. And so even if you said, well, you know what, let's, let's just, let's take a piece of bread and some grape juice and pretend that it's uncle so-and-so's body. It's, you know, his body's in the coffin, but let's just pretend we're eating some uncle, uncle so-and-so pretending to eat somebody's body purely symbolism doesn't make it any better you're no. still pretending to be a cannibal, which is ironically what a lot of these pagan religions would would do, where they would say, um, if you eat, you know, say your 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 elder of the village dies, that you know, sometimes the, this their their children would have to eat the heart or something to take over the power and, and the wisdom of mm -hmm. their elders, or they would do it for their enemies. You know, they they conquer their enemies and then they eat eat some part of them to kind of say, I'm big, I'm grander than you. Um, and I'm taking over, you know, your power, your power is going to be subsumed in me. And so the idea of, of that's what we're being asked to do as Christians is to pretend to be cannibals, to take part in this power of Jesus. It's really sick. And, and to me too, of course, you know, this gets very personal when you think about you teach kids to do this from the earliest days where they think it's normal to, to pretend yeah. to eat somebody's body, yeah. um, to eat your friend's body, to eat, to eat the body of a friend that that's the normal thing in the world because you know hundreds of people around you are doing it the brainwashing it just it disturbs me so much it really really does and yeah how did you when you began to realize some of this stuff is so bizarre and, and cultish that it wasn't like we're the good christians and there's cults over there but no no right. we're actually just another version of the cult right. did it affect you realizing that you know children are being like even if you escape there's still the minute you leave the door, there's still hundreds of kids behind you that yeah. they're not going to get a chance to escape for 20 or 30 years, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, that, that it, what I had decided to do was um, that when I have kids, they were not in any way, shape or form going to be exposed to any religious activities. Um, when you get old enough to you know, develop your logic and your, your reasoning and your intellectualism and your, your, your ability to learn uh, multifaceted, multifaceted types of things. And if you want to make a decision towards a religion, at that point, you can. 
preferably, you know, somewhere in college, if you're doing your religious study and you're hearing about all different types and there's something that appeals to you that you feel like you need a faith. Okay, fine. You've done the research. You've done the, you, you know, you haven't been indoctrinated with daddy's religion or daddy's way. You're, you're, you're gonna, not going to get any of that. <clears throat> now, I, I do think that children should not be exposed to any religious activities. Um, I think it's in the same vein why we don't let children vote. Because what's going to happen, right? The child's going to go down to the polling station. Mom and dad's going to say, pull this lever. <laughs> the family's going to go home. The child's not going to know any of the, the platforms or the the reasons why they're voting for a person or what the person stands for believes in what are the political hot button topics or whatever. They're just going to, because daddy and mommy said so. Um, I remember when, when I was, a, yeah, I was a young Christian. Um, and my, my came time for me to vote for the first time. And I had never voted, of course, because it's a kid and I was a kid most of my life. And I asked my mom, well, mom, who should I vote for? One of the presidential elections, my first one. And she said, you should vote Republican because that's they have the more Christian values. Like, what did I know? What did I, I didn't know anything. So, okay. Every time just. Shh, shh. Um, but it wasn't until I actually started listening for myself and learning for myself, this political both sides. And I thought, what am I doing? <laughs> You know, I, 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 I let myself become engaged with listening to both sides, you know, plotting or feeling what appealed to me, what didn't appeal to me about both sides, and then making my own informed decision based upon information and data. And so I think this is the same way it should be for children. And it hurts me that so many children are still caught in that web because I know they, they're going to, they're, they're going to struggle with it. And, and the more and more we, we, we live in this age of information. Fortunately, less and less kids are being involved with religion. But at some point, because information is, it's becoming so much more available. Um, kids are going to start struggling at an earlier age with these religious ideologies that they've been birthed into and kind of grew up in because it does, it won't, it, it, the information is, 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 it's too much. And these paradigms don't make sense in a world of information and data. So I'm happy about that part, but I'm unhappy because again, now, now this is gonna cause conflict. And I know of too many families that, are, that have this wedge between them, uh, between parents and children, husbands and wives, uh, brothers and sisters, there's this wedge, this ridiculous wedge. Um, and, and that's the unfortunate part. The indoctrination is unfortunate. The wedges and the division and the divisiveness it creates is a, is a, a terrible aspect of it. It's just ugly. It, yeah. You know, it's just, it's just all ugly. It really mm. is. Totally agree. Well, going back to your story next, what were the final days hours like like what was your actual moment of deconversion what would you call it a moment was like was it a day was it an hour was it just yeah. something where you look back and said you know what i must have deconverted at some point but i know i'm deconverted now like how did yeah. that play out and and what was like what was your response to or, or, or how do you still deal with the questions of like the afterlife as a result i think the the, the last big aha moment i had um was Every religion has a God. Every religion has a book. That's, that's when, when that thought hit my mind, that was probably the last freeing thought to it all. So I thought, this is all man-made. Every religion has a God. Every religion has a book about that God. All man-made. And then, and of course, my mind can relate it very easily. There's different car models, different car manufacturers. Right, so Ford, Dodge, you know, Mercedes, BMW. A group of people got together and said, "We want to form a, a car company. We're going to call them Fords. It's going to look like this and do this." And this group together, we're going to do Chrysler, and they're going to look like this and do this. And this group said Mercedes, and this. So it was just groups of people got together and said, "Yeah, this is the car, and this is the greatest car, and the best car. We want everyone to have this car." But then. Everyone said, we don't like Fords. We don't all like Fords. Some of us do, but some of us like this one. And so, so to me, the religion is the same thing. 
you, you, you know, there's different subdivisions. All the houses look the same primarily. In this subdivision, all the houses look the same. So people drive around and say, I don't like that subdivision. Oh, I like this subdivision. And they decide where to live based upon the models and the styles and what it has to offer. And so in all around us, we're, we're, we're surrounded by man-made choices all around us. Religion is no different. It's nothing more than a man-made choice. A man-made something, a man-made system, a structure. And what we have done, we've decided to take our faith, which everyone has a belief system, a ability to believe. We take our faith and say, yep, this is it. This is the one true God. This is the one true religion. I know it. And then someone else says, no way. It's over here. <laughs> you know, what I say is, no, 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 no. All of you knows. Whatever God is, if there is a God, a source, a power, being, a light, a love, an energy, whatever it is, I can't see it having any interaction with humans on a daily basis because there's too many things it doesn't do that it should do if it's going to interact with human beings on a daily basis. Yeah. I can't see that this source is power, this whatever we, that I believe we all came from gives a rat's dropping whether or not we figure out who it is because it's 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 insignificant to it then care it, it, we're not here for that to figure out who god is what what's right what the bible says what jesus did none of that was relevant it's really relevant when it when it's when this largest scale of what i believe us as eternal beings are so um i i, I watch a lot of ndes and there's always, at least the ones I primarily watch, there's this one common thread running through them all. It's that when they were conscious on the other side, the love they felt, the light they saw, surpassed anything they could ever imagine. And they knew that they were one with that and part of that and had come from that and had come back home to that. And that's one common thread they all seem to have. So I think we're just down here having our own personal experience as we perhaps chose to come. And I don't know if we, we framed out every aspect of our world, of our lives, but maybe it's just as simple as us saying, you know what, I want to try that earth experience next. You know what, now I'm going to go over there and do that one. Because if we're eternal beings, which I believe we are, and the universe is this massive <laughs> um, amount of space and opportunity and, and dimensions and galaxies. It's just, just, just massive, endless. Then the concept of us coming here for 70, 80 years, somehow or another discovering God and Jesus, somehow or another through all the confusion of life and all the chaos of life and all of the things we learn and have to unlearn and figure out and don't figure out and understand and all that, all that life stuff, then having to try to figure out we need Jesus, we need to get saved or else. I, I can't see that as being something that this was all part of what was supposed to happen. It just is, that's too, it's way too small, way too chaotic or, or, or archaic for me to consider that that's possibly the scenario here that's really at play. So, so you think, think that when we die, we do go somewhere? I do think we go somewhere, um, perhaps back to, to our origin to figure out what we do next. Um, hmm. I don't think it's a heaven or a hell. Um, if you had a way to find out that it wasn't anything that we just turn into dirt again and we don't go anywhere, would that frustrate you about life or like, how would you like, cause a lot of atheists and a lot of people that deconvert don't land where you're mentioning, which, which um, it reminds me a little bit of reincarnation. And I don't know if you'd use that word or not, but like, what if, what if we don't go anywhere? Will that, would that upset you if you could find out that for sure? I know we can't find out that for sure, but right. if you knew it were possible to see what was going to happen the moment after you die and, you find out it's it's nothing how would you feel about that you know it wouldn't upset me it would drive me to get out here and, and live the best part of this experience i can live hmm. you know if, if i knew beyond all certainty beyond all doubt rather that when i close my eyes that's it forever 
nothing else, then okay, fine. You know, because I don't, I, I mean, I, I don't know what's really next anyway, but if I had that certainty, then more, more than ever, there's absolutely no need for religion whatsoever. No use for it whatsoever. No need. And it's nothing yes. more than a consuming waste of time that has engulfed the precious time we have here on this earth. And if that's all we have, then I will commit my life to the rest of this time, living it up to the best possible way of what pleases me, what makes me happy, what brings me joy, and just cherishing every part of it, completely losing myself from frustration, worry, fear, anxiety. I would get rid of all of that stuff immediately. The best, like I'm trying to do now for the most part, but I would completely get rid of that stuff. If nothing mattered, if no, I would... I'd be, I'm already pretty laid back, but I'd be extremely metal and laid back. I would just do what I need to do to live the best possible experience I can live here with that much love. And what makes me happy? Love, right? Love mm -hmm. makes me happy. Family makes me happy. Being around good people makes me happy. Eating good food makes me happy. You know, talking to good people makes me happy. Staying away from ne negativity and chaos makes me happy. So I would surround myself with that and dedicate myself to that fully and just live it up to the very last minute and try to do it as healthy as I can so I can live as long as I can if I know this is all there's going to be. Hmm. I love that answer. Yeah, and I would just I'd tack on to the idea of, um, like I like to say to my kids, just leave this place, plan it better than we found it. You know, it's yeah. like, yeah. make sure that, mm -hmm. like you said, with when you add up all that stuff, you mentioned loving people, mm -hmm. caring about people, um, freeing ourselves from from mythology, you're, you're effectively, hopefully, enjoying your life more for whatever years you've got and then leaving it better for the next generation. And um, I, I do, I do, I've interviewed a few people who've, who've thought that maybe there's something. I think most people I interview tend to lean towards there's probably nothing at all. But I do get the idea that it's, like you mentioned, near death experiences. There's other those other things that certainly at least spark our, our imagination and our creativity. Right. And just to say, yeah. just maybe. I'm I'm open. I'm completely yeah. open. That's mm -hmm. what I am. Except open to heaven or hell. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I do. I do want to ask. I know I've kept you. I do want to ask kind of a final question. And, and you know, if there's anything else that's on your heart, please add to it. But mm -hmm. the the question of how people respond to you. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people have found that the result of deconversion or even any kind of serious deconstruction, but for sure deconversion is to say, like if, if you were in it, like really in it, not like just someone that was exploring it, but you know, I, I looked at Christianity, but no, I'm not, not going to go that route, but you're in it. You're especially for you, you're, you're in ministry, you're, you're ordained. You know the word from you know backwards and forwards. You can quote it when you're asleep. Mm -hmm. You probably did quote it in your dreams or something. Yeah. Um, it's just it's part of your psyche. It's it's like you know the Bible's in your blood. It's like you've got you know white blood cells, red blood cells, and you got Bible blood cells in there. You know it's <laughs> it's part of your psyche, your worldview, yeah. mm -hmm. and they know it because you were one of them, and they love the fact that you're one of them. And then you, being one of them, leave. Um, kind of again to go use the North Korea illustration. If you leave, you'd love to think that they'd love want to love you back to Christ, but in reality, a lot of times you end up being treated like a traitor. Yeah. And I was wondering if that was true for you, or if you've hopefully had some more gracious experiences. Like what what's been the result? Um, if your mom is is, is still with us, how's how she or any other family members responded? How do your siblings respond? Like, are is anyone shunning you? And maybe a corollary how how did you kind of start over once your community shifted so dramatically yeah well uh, fortunately for me um when i ventured into the faith camp and the grace camp and unconditional love camps um, i had already started receiving um withdrawals from people people always starting to withdraw because because I, you know i just i i believed in each phase wholeheartedly so if it's about faith, then let's be about faith. Let's leave all this other stupidity alone. Well, if it's about grace and the finished work, then let's leave all this other stupidity alone. Let's just be about grace. Let's be about the finished work. Well, if it's about unconditional love and nothing else really matters because we're loved unconditionally and there's nothing we can do to ever make a God not love us because we're loved unconditionally, then let's leave all this other foolishness alone. And that rubbed a lot of my pastor friends the wrong way because, you know, they need the control and the fear and the manipulation to keep their churches going. 
keep the offerings coming, to keep the people attending and keep people fearfully engaged. They need that. Um, I was willing to free people from that. I preached grace in my church up until we stopped having church. Grace, 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 you're free. You don't have to come to church if you don't want to. You don't have to do anything you don't want to because Jesus paid it all. Jesus did it all. You're free. Stop condemning yourself. Stop worrying about what you don't get right. You don't got to get it right. It's already been made right. So I, I, I just want to free people. I just want people to be free, you know, as I was f- becoming free. I just wanted to give back what I was experiencing at the time. So I had, I had people leaving me early on. Um, and then when I got here, um, fortunately, because of, I think because of my personality and how I am, how I treat people, when people like on Facebook comment back with, you know, their indoctrinated, angry views, I have person with love. Thank you for, your, for sharing your thought. We disagree, mm. but, you know, I, I understand. And I, you know, I, I knew the early and I wasn't going to argue with people. Because I knew that when I believe what I believe, no one can argue with me. No one's going to convince me otherwise. So I decided to embrace people with love and accept people with love. I don't block people. I don't, you know, unfriend people. I, I've never done that. I, I, I listen, thank you. Um, and, and I think over time, people have come to see that and it, feel that energy coming from me, um, no matter what I post or what I say. And I, I tend to get grace from that. As far as the family is concerned, oh, I, I had the privilege in the sense of pastoring my family. And when I took over the church, it was part of our own church. So my mom, I would pass it my mom and my siblings. Uh, my mom is still very hardcore, uh, indoctrinated person, not as indoctrinated and, and bound to it as she once was, but still pretty Jesus centric, God centric and things like that. And we've had our discussions and we, we've always had healthy debates because throughout the years, things never made sense to me. So I would debate her about different things. So we've always had lively debates. We don't do it as much anymore. Um, I don't think she's happy where I am because as a mother, I think she's concerned that I'm going to end up in hell. So that, you know, that love of a mother is very concerned about that. And she says to me once, well, Kyle, I've, I'm praying for you. And I said, well, why pray? goes well because I, I i want god to, to get a hold of you and i said so your god's going to violate my will because i don't want your god <laughs> you know and i try to give her stuff like that just and let her just get her thinking you know because think about what you're saying mom you know you're using a tactic called witchcraft that you don't believe in you're going to voodoo your god over me like i have no choice so but we don't debate as much as we used to she loves me i love her my sisters love me they too they haven't deconstructed as far as I have, but they have deconstructed from a lot of the churchism and church nonsense that we grew up in. They're free. Um, they're happy where they are. They know they don't need to do all those things anymore and never really made sense. So I, 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 get, I have the support and love of my family. Um, every now and then they'll, they'll, they'll chime in with, and, and you know, say something in a supportive way. I have some family members that call me sometime and see something. They'll call me and question, well, how did you get here? What made you stop believing? And I'll break it down to me, just explain to them. And I try to do also everything I post and share from a first person perspective, from a Kyle perspective, meaning I think, I feel, I believe, I see. I try not to, you know, post anything that suggests I'm right, you're wrong. I'm just saying, hey, this is how I see it. This is what I believe. This is what I think. And I think that too kind of cuts down on some of the fighting because if I say everyone that goes to church is stupid, well, uh, you know, can I say that? Because there's people that sincerely go to church and believe they're doing the, the right thing and the godly thing and thing they should do. But I might say church is irrelevant. And as far as I can see, as far as I understand, based on my experience, church is an irrelevant thing. So I open it up that way. So it's less, it's less intimidating, less, less that though. But I did have people leave me and unfriend me pastors and people that I preached with and preached at their churches and at my churches. And I understand it because they want to protect the brand and I get it. But privately, some of these same pastors see me and talk to me privately and they know, they know, but they can't tell their people. Because who would go to church if they believed they didn't have to go to church? Mm. Who would give an offering if they believed they didn't have to give an offering? Who would do the things they do if they believed they didn't have to do the things they do? Who would go to work if they believed they didn't have to go to work? I mean, we don't do stuff we don't believe we have to do. 
when you say Most some of, of the pastors do. know, mm-hmm. do you do you mean by that that some of them know that it's mythology? Yeah, some of them know that this is this is BS. Mm-hmm. Now, privately, we have talks and, and they say things privately, but they say, man, I, I can never say that to my church. And I know why. Mm-hmm. Because you're afraid that if you do, if you set people free, they'll stop coming. If they stop coming, they'll stop giving. And I get it. But, uh, you know, let's just call it for what it is. I, I, I'm going to do a video about this. There's, and I looked it up. There's about 380,000 churches here in America estimated as of 2020. So you mean to tell me that a God needs 380 people speaking for it? A God can't talk to people itself? So really what you have is 380,000 places where money is being collected. 380,000 places where one person, man or woman, is the dominant voice of those people. Mm-hmm. 380 places of real estate being you know, used to house these places. 380,000 places where people feel like only here is the presence of God alive. That's what you really have. And when you honestly acknowledge that, then I think we can get to the solution, which is getting rid of all this nonsense, um, mm. which I do think we're, 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 in, we're trending in that direction. I really think we are. Yeah. Humanity. I think it's, you're such an inspiration in terms of the, um, not just your overall story, but just your graciousness, I think is a good call to action for, for all of us in the community, because, you know, we a lot of us came out of fundamentalism, which it sounds like you were probably slightly different and and it wasn't quite as militant maybe as some of us, but um, the idea of like, I'm right. And, and, and everyone else is wrong. And, you know, I'm the only one with the, with the truth and that, that black and white, like there's no gray area to any of these discussions. Yeah, I was there. You're there there early on. I was early on. I was a Pharisee to the core. Okay. Uh, Well, I would put myself in the same boat then and, you know, a lot of us struggle with, even though we escape Christianity, the tendency to be completely black and white with no gray area and the tendency to be fundamentalist still pops out. And we really yeah. struggle with that. And of course, fundamentalism is well known for being graceless. And the idea of being graceful as atheists is so important. Um, I, I love the fact that you're bringing that to our attention. And I think one of the things that has helped me a lot, we, we said a while ago, I'll keep this short because I know we've been going for a while. Uh, we said a while ago a whole bunch of things about like God doesn't make sense. Like, and, and it's almost like you get angry at God for like, God, why won't you intervene with the friend that's got cancer? And why won't you give me your will? Why won't you clarify what your will is? If I'm supposed to be married, who and when? And it, it ends up feeling like this whole pile of, of like, oh, I'm so upset or frustrated and even angry. And in reality, what we're angry at is not God because he's not right. there. What we're angry right. at is the system. It's, 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 it's right. mythology or, or Christianity right. is, is, is institu- institutionalized mythology. Right. We're mm-hmm. upset at the, at the institution that we be, become part of. We're, we're part of a machine yeah. and we're upset that we're inside the machine and that we're even at times major hubs of the machine. Mm-hmm. But to, to realize eventually, I'm not actually angry at God. I'm effectively, I guess, you know, like I said, starting, I'm angry at the machine, but I'm actually, I'm angry at myself because I, I should have seen the cognitive dissonance for what it was. Yeah. And eventually you're like, okay, you, and people do, they, 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 they say, you know, you're just angry at God. And eventually you have to deal with that as a, as an atheist to say, is that what, you know, is, is that truly what's happening? Right. But you realize it's, that's not what's happening at all no. because you're no. not angry at, at a deity. Not you're but you are angry at yourself yeah. Yeah. and i think it almost becomes comical when you realize that we are we're angry at ourselves because some men mostly men from thousands mm-hmm. of years ago yeah. wrote a book that mm-hmm. got heavily edited and redacted and controlled mm-hmm. by other men for hundreds and even thousands of years it got translated into our language and preached and edit and 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 uh and uh, interpreted by mostly men in our culture mm-hmm. yeah. and then we inherit this 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 system mm-hmm. and there's nothing to it like it's literally just right. dead men speaking 
It's right. just we're 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 letting dead men speak into our lives and dominate right. our worldviews. Exactly. And it's like you you sit back at a certain point, you're like, this is this is stinking stupid. Like yeah. I am literally letting dead men control my thoughts about sexuality. Yeah. Dead men control my thoughts about yeah. whether or not I'm good or not. A dead man control my pocketbook, um, yeah. my you know, my wallet. It's like this is so stupid. Yeah. And once yeah. you get to that point, a lot of the to me at least the anger drops. Like, right. I'm not angry at this God because I don't think he's there. So I'm not angry right. at him anymore. And I'm not going to be angry at myself anymore because I'm going to call it for what it is. This right. is just dead men speaking. That's all it's mm -hmm. ever been is dead men trying to speak. And I'm going to put this thing to bed. I'm going to be done. And I'm going to start over. And I love, I love, you know, as I interview people, the fact that so many of them do find that this, this is like being born again, again. Yeah. Yeah. And there's, I know there's a Facebook group by that name. So I give kudos to them for that great title, but being born again, again, and you're like, holy smokes, I've whatever life I've got, whether it's, you know, 10 years or 30 years, hopefully 50 years, whatever time I've got, yeah. I'm starting from this day on yep. to truly get rid of as much bad ideas as Matt Delhoney yep. says, and cling to as many good ideas as I can, yep. many true ideas. And it it's amazing the the the, the anger drops. Yeah. The, yeah. the depression drops and you're like, mm -hmm. this is the way life should have been the whole time, mm -hmm. but I'm starting today and I'm going to make the best of it. And anyway, that's, mm -hmm. that's, it's been my experience that a lot of, a lot of things just eventually get to be silly. You're like, I'm not even fighting Christianity. It's just, I'm more laughing at it. Not in a yeah. mocking sense. I'm like, look, you know, laughing at my former self. I'm like, this was, this yeah. was stupid. Yeah. 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 That's another thing I do too. When I post, I put myself as the fool in the story. I used to believe how crazy was I? I once thought, man, that was stupid. I put myself as the fool in most of these stories as well. Um, and you're right. I'm not angry at a God. You know, I'm, I fight against the narratives, these, these nonsensical narratives that we've built around God. Um, I, I just had a thought earlier that I'll write something about is, you know, the easiest way to hide racism and hatred of another is to hide it behind religion and a god so mm -hmm. you know we, we 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 just use these things as props to to hide our beliefs and our feelings or whatever behind and, and so i'm not angry at a god because i know that the religious version of the christian god i grew up with doesn't exist so i, I can't project anger at that um <clears throat> i'm i i i I dislike strongly the narratives because it's the narratives that are still deceiving people as I see it, causing people great trauma as I see it, causing people to be delusional as I see it, causing people to live outside of what they are naturally known to be and do. And I think if we get rid of the narratives, then humanity just is better. We're better people without these religious narratives. They divide us. They hurt us. They they categorize us. If you have an ideology based on the fact that you're chosen and you're God's favorite and everyone else is a sinner, nasty, God hates them, then guess what? You're going to see them, view them, treat them the same way. And you may not acknowledge that on the surface. Oh, no, I love everybody. No, you don't. Because deep down inside, it's in breaded in you that you're God's favorite. You're one of the chosen. Everyone else is a Philistine, an Amalekah, you know, Hishbite, these bites that God hates and wants to, wants to destroy. And whether it's a black person, a Hispanic person, a woman, anybody, a gay person, a, you know, whatever, whatever you frame your hatred towards, then they're now the Philistines worthy of being destroyed. You're the good, righteous Christian, the David with the sling in your hand, and you're out trying to kill as many of these Goliaths as you can find. And, you know, again, you may not say that on the surface, but inside, subconsciously, deep down inside, that's really how you approach this. And you go to church and you feel high and lifted up and you come out of church. Cause I used to do the same thing. I used to come out of the church, look at my surrounding area and think, all you people disgust me, all of you, yeah. all of you on these corners, all of you, no good people. You're all disgusting, totally nasty people. That's how I saw things. Cause I just, I was in church for two hours being told how I've got it right. I'm with God. I'm on God's side. Bless the, and the world favorite. isn't. Yeah. I'm God's favorite. Yeah. So it's, it's amazing. And it, I think the, 
corollary to that too is when you escape you get to see mm-hmm. people for for who they yes. are and you yes like i i don't know about you but when i was a christian people of other religions and certainly people of of uh, who were not heterosexual i didn't really care about their story like their story yeah. didn't matter it was just like your story doesn't really begin until you become a christian what? otherwise you're just doing something for the devil mm-hmm. and to, to see people for the first time not as like i need to evangelize you i need to change you and just to say i need to just hear your story that's all i need to do is just hear your story and be your friend yeah. what a yeah. beautiful way to to approach humanity and just to, to yeah. feel like you're free for the first time to let someone be different and that's okay yeah yeah and to, mm. to accept people where they are and how they are and that's another element that coming into what i believe is an understanding of myself as a love being the best i know how to do is to love this mm. is something i've naturally known how to do since i was born everything else i had to learn so whenever I'm being instinctive to what I know, then I'm really living life. Whenever I'm going outside my instinctive knowing of love, then I'm creating an environment that it's manufactured based on these other learned things through religion, through society, through whatever. And, and then when I, when I look back on it and contemplate those moments, I've always done well in the love arenas when I've, when I've been able to look at people with a loving eye versus an eye of hate and disdain when i'm able to engage people based upon a a ideal that we're one and we're the same and you're no different than i am and i'm no different than you are i'm no better than you you're no better than me when i'm able to see people for who they are as individuals um i had a huge problem with you know people who drank and people who were street walkers and people who were just you know living below I had a huge problem with people who acted thuggish and because I grew up in an urban environment. So I had a huge problem with a lot of different segments of my society, huge problem. And I treated them as if you don't matter until you get saved. And then when you get saved, we can talk, but until then you don't matter and you will Mm -hmm. never matter to me. And um, that's a horrible way to live. It's a horrible way to come out of your house and look at people and and know that that is instinctively inside of you. Yeah. Um, to treat people with, with, uh, without dignity and honor as being a human being just like you are. It's a terrible thing. And I'm so mm-hmm. glad I'm free from that. I'm so, so glad I'm free from that. Because that's one of the things deconstruction did for me. It freed me from that and allowed me to see people and treat people with dignity, humanity. It's mm. a great point. Great point to wrap up one of uh, just the the humanity that comes out of all this we really do we so much it's like that that song um once i was blind but now i see yeah and it's like that's that's what's actually happening here is it, it, we yeah. were we were blind when we were in christianity now that we're out we are free for the first time and it's it's so freeing i completely agree yes. with you i i love it i've i've got so many things going to my head in terms of topics i want to dig into but i do have some topical um interview kind of ideas going on down the line uh even group interviews i'm going to be interviewing two or three people at a time and you definitely come to mind for several of those topics so i'm hoping i can have you back at some point and jump into some of those group discussions um but i just want to say thank you um cal Uh, of course the big picture i'm so glad that you got out i'm so glad you escaped that's the biggest point of all um thank you for what you do for the community for your messages especially the messages of kindness and grace to the people that are still in it um and just like we used to say, they'll know we're Christians by our love. Maybe we should, you know, adopt that. They'll know we're atheists by our love and <laughs> yeah. um, love the amount of it, you know. And it, but I say that tongue in cheek, but it really is true. You know, we do need yeah. to, to show them that we're we're in many ways. Our, our morality, our, yeah. our everything is better. Everything's better on the side of it. Yeah, and um, for sure. So I appreciate your story, and your, your, your exhortations there. And was there anything else you wanted to add before we wrap up? Listen, I want to thank you as well for having me. And um it's been a pleasure. And, and, uh, you know, we, we, <clears throat> I, I, I don't get an opportunity to talk as much because I don't have that platform anymore. I, I took myself out of those platforms because I wanted to be sincere. Um, I, 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 I didn't, I couldn't see myself getting up every week anymore, just talking, just to talk. And I needed to be sincere. 
And so thank you so much for giving me an opportunity to be sincere and to talk openly and freely in a very safe environment. And thank you for what you do for, uh, you know, people that may be considered out in the desert, kind of wandering, looking for um, a, a common place of thought, belief, and, and feeling. So thank you, because these places are so vital and because so many people feel alone. But as I said, thank goodness for technology and information. So the YouTube and Facebook and these different social media channels, people are able to find your content and feel like, you know what, I'm not by myself. I'm not alone. There's other people who feel and think and see just like I do. And I'm not crazy. So thank you for the vision you had to create this and put it together and give people space to come and feel safe, because I know that's probably one of the biggest reasons why you did it. So thank you. Yeah, thank you for saying so. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's been so, that's a great point too, that we need each other to, to know that we're not alone in this. So many people do feel alone. It's it's so good to know that, no, I'm, I'm not crazy. I'm thinking of some good questions and a lot of other people have already thought about them. So there's some good answers out there and it's it's great, great point. Well, again, appreciate your time, Kyle. I'm so good to get to know you. Definitely want to do it again. So thank you for your for your story and we'll, uh, we'll hopefully meet up again soon. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Kyle.